thief. Thomas stood at Farqua, the top station of his branch line. He had run round Annie and Clarabel after the morning journey and was enjoying a short rest before the run back down the valley. His driver and fireman stood beside his cab talking to the guard who'd brought startling news. Did you know that the station master was burgled last night? He was asking. Thomas's driver shook his head. You don't say, he exclaimed. I didn't know he had anything worth stealing. He's won cups for gardening, exclaimed the fireman. All taken, and then the scoundrels had the cheek to pinch his car to carry them away in. Not that new one he's so proud of, said the driver. The guard nodded, and at that moment the signal rose to show that the line was clear. The driver and fireman climbed into Thomas's cab. The guard blew his whistle, waved his green flag and got into Clarabel, and Thomas set off. By the time they were through the tunnel, the train was running nicely. Road and railway were beside each other here, with only a stream between them. Thomas remembered his race with Bertie the bus. He'd only won because he could go through the hill, while Bertie had to go over it. A flash of colour on the road ahead caught his eye. He tried to go faster to look more closely. Steady, Thomas, said his driver. There's plenty of time. Can't we get closer to that car? panted Thomas. It looks like station masters to me. Lots of cars look like that, laughed the driver. But he opened the regulator and they began to draw level. There were two men in the car. They waved when they saw Thomas and tried to go faster. That's the car all right, Thomas, said the fireman, and those two must be the thieves. But we can't stop them, and they'll be gone long before the next station. We need pencil, paper, and something to put a note in, said the driver. We'll throw a message out at the next signal box. Quickly, he wrote the note, and they put it in the fireman's empty lunch tin. Then, drawing ahead of the car, Thomas whistled to attract the signalman's attention. They slowed so that the fireman could throw the box up to him, and as they went past, both driver and fireman shouted, Police! at the top of their voices. By now, the stolen car had gone well ahead, and Thomas did not see it again. But the signalman telephoned police headquarters at once, and the thieves were stopped at a roadblock about ten miles further on. That afternoon, the fat controller travelled in Annie to Farqua. When he got there, he and the station master climbed onto a porter's trolley. They told the passengers the whole story, and the station master thanked Thomas, his driver, and his fireman for their prompt action. The passengers cheered loudly, and they cheered even more when they heard that the station master's gardening cups had all been found undamaged in a sack in the boot of the car. A long time ago, said the fat controller, holding up his hand for silence, Thomas showed how valuable he is to the smooth running of my railway. I am sure you will all agree that today he has once again proved himself to be a really useful engine. Mind that bike. Percy had never known Tom Tipper to be anything but cheerful. Tom was postman at Farquhar, and every morning he would have a cheery word for Percy as he helped to load the mailbags onto the train. Percy then took them to the town, where there was a big office for sorting the letters. But one morning, Tom wasn't there. A postman they didn't know just dumped the bags on the platform and bicycled off without stopping to help. What's happened to Tom? wondered Percy's driver. And his old van, added the fireman. No wonder the new chap looks fed up. Carrying mail bags on a bike would make anyone miserable. Tom was soon back, but without his van. During his illness, it had been decided that the van was too expensive to run. Poor Tom was no longer cheerful, and now had no time to help load the train. I wish I could cheer him up, sighed Percy, the small engine. One day, a man came from the station office to tell Tom that some papers needed signing. Oh dear, he said anxiously, this is going to make me very late. He asked Percy to keep an eye on his bicycle while he was gone and propped it carefully against the fence near the platform ramp. He was gone a long time and had not returned when Percy was ready to go. Some boys were playing on the platform and Percy was worried. Sorry, Percy, said his driver. We must be off. Time and the fat controller wait for no man. In the flurry of starting, no one noticed that one of the boys had picked up Tom's bicycle. He pedalled too far along the platform, and before he could stop, ran out of control down the ramp. He reached the bottom just as Percy started away. 
Fortunately, the boy fell clear in time, but the bicycle swerved beneath Percy's wheels and disappeared with a crunch. Percy's driver stopped the train quickly and they extracted the remains, but the red bicycle was beyond repair. Tom came running and he, the driver, the station master and the guard all told the boys what bad boys they were. I'm sorry, Mr. Tipper, apologised Percy. Never mind, Percy, said the postman. It wasn't your fault and I never liked that bag much anyway. When the fat controller heard about the accident, he ordered that Tom should be provided with a new bicycle at once. But next morning, when Percy arrived at Farquhar, he saw a brand new red van standing in the yard beside the ruins of the bicycle. Close by stood Tom Tipper, beaming from ear to ear. That accident did me a good turn, Percy, he smiled, and now my chief has decided to let me have a new van after all. So I did help, said Percy to himself when Tom had gone. By accident, as you might say. Fish the fishermen who used the port near the big station were bringing in more fish than ever before. Each day the sheds on the quayside were piled high with boxes. Much of this extra fish had to travel by rail, so the trains which Henry and the other engines had to pull became heavier. One night a special load of fish was ordered and the fat controller decided that extra vans must be added to the train that the men called the Flying Kipper. The only spare vans that they could find were old ones that had been standing unused on a siding for some time. Workmen cleaned them quickly and they were added to the tail of the train. Henry grumbled dreadfully about it, but there was nothing to be done. You'll just have to put up with it, Henry, said his driver. At least the extra load will mean we can have a banker up Gordon's Hill. Duck often waited at Edward Station so that he could help heavy trains by pushing behind. Tonight, Henry made good progress in spite of his extra load. When they reached Edward Station, his driver stopped the train beyond the platform. Then, using Henry's whistle, he gave the special signal which meant that he wanted help up the hill. Peep, 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 whistled Henry. I need a banker, please. Peep, peep, replied Duck. I shan't be long. Duck buffered gently up to Henry's train. He was not coupled on so that Henry could run on without stopping when they reached the top. Ready, Duck whistled. Pull hard, pull hard, puffed Henry. We're doing it, we're doing it, replied Duck. Henry was pulling harder than he thought. It was a dark night and Duck felt the weight on his buffers slacken. Because of the dark, he could not see that Henry had taken the train on his own and was slowly drawing ahead. All trains carry a red lamp on the final vehicle to show that the train is complete. This is called a tail lamp. Duck's driver began to be worried. There's no sign of a tail lamp, he said to the fireman, but we must keep going. Duck whistled, but there was no reply from Henry. Henry, meanwhile, was going well, but his train seemed to be getting heavier. He had to keep moving, but he could not avoid slowing down. Suddenly, from behind him, there came a splintering crash. Duck's front bent and pieces of broken wood began to fall on him, one of them denting his funnel. He stopped quickly, and Henry, feeling the jolt, stopped too, just beyond the top of the hill. Over Gordon's hill, a smell of fish hung on the air. By the light of torches, the drivers and firemen tried to work out what had happened, while the guard ran back down the hill to warn the signalman. When daylight came, it was all too obvious. The lamp iron on the old van, which should have held the tail lamp, had broken, and the lamp had fallen off at the bottom of the hill. Not your fault, Duck, said the fat controller. That lamp iron should have been checked. Don't worry, we'll soon have your funnel and front straightened out. Thank you, sir, said Duck sadly. Thomas told me once to be careful about fish. He was right, sir, wasn't he? Triple header. Gordon was resting in a siding. It was a hot day and the express had been heavy. I get so out of breath, he complained. But nobody cares. They just say, I'll be all right after a rest. Get the fat controller to give you tanks and a bunker, suggested Thomas cheekily. You'll feel a new engine. We tank engines never get out of breath, you know. Perhaps it was lucky for Thomas that poor Gordon hadn't the energy to reply. The men worked hard on Gordon, but they couldn't make him better. You need new tubes, Gordon, they said. You'll have to go to the works to have them fitted. 
While Gordon was being mended, Henry pulled the express. But one morning, just before Gordon was due back, Henry was ill too. We've no spare engine except Thomas, the inspector told the fat controller. But he can't pull the train on his own. Could Percy help? asked the fat controller. The inspector shook his head. The two of them with Duck might manage, he suggested. It's only as far as the works. They're sure to have a spare engine there. So, the three tank engines were coupled together. Thomas nearest the train, Duck in the middle, and Percy at the front. Then, slowly, they started. Come on! Come on! fussed Percy importantly. We're doing it! We're doing it! puffed Duck. Pull harder! Pull harder! rumbled Thomas to the others. The heavy train drew out of the platform. The engines couldn't go as fast as Gordon, but the passengers didn't mind. They knew that Percy, Thomas and Duck were doing their best. Expresses are not like branch line trains. They don't stop at all the stations and the engines don't have a chance to get their breath back. Soon the three began to feel tired. They struggled valiantly up Gordon's Hill, but the strain was beginning to tell. I'm glad we didn't stick there, thought Thomas. Gordon would never have let us hear the last of it. But the hill proved too much for Percy. His driver blew his whistle and stopped the train. We can't take you off, Percy, said Thomas's driver. Do the best you can to keep your brakes off. It's not far now. This made things harder for the other two, but they struggled gamely on, twin columns of steam shooting high into the air. We're nearly there, we're nearly there, puffed Thomas and Duck together as they summoned a last brave effort. Poor Percy had no steam left to say anything. They were just passing the works when Duck found he could go no further. Thomas could not pull the heavy train on his own and the cavalcade came to a standstill a few yards short of the station platform. And there, standing watching from the work siding, stood Gordon. The fat controller who'd been on the train told the three engines he was proud of them. You did very well to get so far, he said, and now you deserve a rest. Duck, Percy and Thomas were uncoupled and a new engine took their place. As the tank engines moved wearily away, Gordon looked at Thomas and smiled. Then he took three deep breaths and winked. He didn't need to say anything. Thomas knew exactly what he meant. preferred steam engines on his railway, but he found diesels useful because they could pull either coaches or trucks. You're versatile, he would say to them, real mixed traffic engines. Boko and Bear were proud of this, but James was not impressed. He liked these two diesels, but he treated all others with deep suspicion. Diesels don't use coal and water, he would say darkly. How can you trust an engine who isn't normal in his habits? Visiting Diesel sometimes boasted about how special they were. Usually Boko and Bear had to spend the next day smoothing ruffled feelings. One day a particularly haughty Diesel came from the other railway. When the visitor found that he was to share the shed with steam engines, he stopped outside in disgust and refused to go any further. Why on earth does your controller keep such out-of-date objects? he growled rudely dirty, smoky, slow things. Ugh. He shuddered delicately. On our railway, the diesel continued loftily, steam engines are kept strictly in their place and not allowed on the main line without special permission. Boko, who was showing the diesel round, lost patience. Stay outside then if you're so proud about it, he said crossly. I'm going to join my friends. I hope it's cold tonight and he can't start in the morning, snorted James. At least someone might want to preserve us. Who'd need him? 
old stuck up. The engines were glad when morning came. They went to fetch their trains as early as they could and the visitor was left alone. That's better, he purred to himself. How can an engine rest in all that hissing and clanking? The cleaning equipment and fuel supply were in the part of the shed which Boko and Bear shared. Old Stuckup was so full of self-importance that he'd forgotten he would need cleaning and refueling before he went home. It was getting late when he remembered. If I go in now while the shed is empty, he said to himself, no one will know I've been. He scuttled forward quickly, too quickly. The rails where Bear and Boko had stood were oily, and when he tried to stop, he couldn't. Brake blocks and buffers, I'm slipping, he wailed as his wheels locked and slithered. He shut his eyes as, with a despairing whoop of horror, he crashed into the wall at the end of the shed. The diesel was not badly damaged, but a dreadful draught came through the hole in the wall. When the other engines came home, they heard the story from Douglas, who had cleared up the mess. Ho, 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 chortled Henry. Old Stuckup came unstuck, did he? I say, Boko, what is it the fat controller calls you? Versatile, chuckled Boko. But that isn't what he called Stuckup. I couldn't hear all he said, but I didn't think it sounded very polite. Crossed lines. Most of the Fat Controller's engines accepted diesels. James had never liked them. They're all right, said Henry, just mixed traffic engines like you and me. Mixed up engines, you mean, James grunted, with windows at each end. How can they know if they're coming or going? Toby has two cabs, remarked Duck, and he gets on all right. Toby's just a little engine, scoffed James. If an important engine like me didn't know which way to turn, what would the railway come to? All the engines agreed that James was becoming much too puffed up in his smoke box. Making out his royalty or something, grumbled Henry. It's disgusting. I knew an engine called King James, remarked Duck, in the old days at Paddington. King James the first, he was. But he didn't swank about like that. Oh, then I be telling James that, pleaded Donald. It's even mere of a misery he'll be making our lives. Exactly, agreed Henry but who's going to trim his wheels for him? The engines tried all sorts of ideas, but nothing worked. James grew so conceited that the others were glad when he was away. Even the coaches twittered anxiously to each other if they thought he was to pull them. One day, James came to the shed, fuming with rage. Shunting, he snorted. Where are Donald and Douglas? They should be here for jobs like that but the twins were helping on Edward's branch line, so James had to do the work himself. James's train had long trucks called well wagons. These have bogey wheels at each end, with a low section between them. They're used to carry cars, tractors, and other heavy machinery. The shunting should have been easy, but James was cross and bumped the trucks. Oh, 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 they cried. Some of them slipped their brakes on to spike James. The weather was damp and misty too, so the shunting took a long time. At last, James had only two trucks to fetch before his train was ready. Because of the mist, the signalman sometimes found it hard to see what was happening. James's driver told him that James would whistle when they had collected all the trucks and were clear of the points. They had almost finished when suddenly James heard a sharp peep peep from another engine close by. The signalman heard it too, and thought it was James saying he was ready. He pulled the lever, setting the points for the main line. But James wasn't ready. The points changed when one of the trucks was halfway over them. One bogey went the right way, but the other was diverted towards the main line. Before James realised it, the truck was travelling sideways between the two lines. A signal stood right in its path. Stop! squealed the truck, but it was too late. The signal toppled to the ground with a crash, just missing James. That's torn it, said James's driver. The fat controller won't like that. He didn't. He spoke severely about it, because the signal was important and its loss was inconvenient. James knew that the accident was not his fault, but he was unusually quiet in the shed that evening. The others were relieved. 
I suppose it must be difficult to know which way to go when you've got two cabs, whispered a voice, but to go two ways at once with only one cab, that really is something. James pretended he hadn't heard. Fire engine. Flying Scotsman and my brothers were all green, explained Gordon one night in the shed. It was all very well in its way, but now I prefer my blue. It makes me different, you see, and that's very suitable for an important engine like me. The engines in our old line used to be blue, remembered Donald, but nay say dark as we are. Dougie and me never were, though. We had to be black, say blue makes a nice change. I like my green too, agreed Henry. I'd hate to be red like James. People would think I was a fire engine. At least people can see me coming, retorted James. I don't disappear into the background like some engines I could mention. If it wasn't for the noise, you'd need a yellow and black front like Mavis. Henry's protests were drowned in the laughter of the other engines, and he went to sleep wondering how to pay James out. Henry was still cross next morning. What can be wrong? What can be wrong? wondered the coaches anxiously as Henry pulled noisily away from the big station. Do come along! Do come along! Henry snorted impatiently. They had a fast run, but it didn't improve Henry's temper. He bumped the coaches when they reached the end of the line and again when he backed onto them for the return journey. He simmered angrily while the firemen fastened the coupling. No one noticed a rattle from beneath Henry's footplate as he snorted away, and soon the train was running well. Hurry, 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 puffed Henry. Faster and faster they went. At last, Henry began to feel better. Suddenly, he heard a crack from below his cab. Look out, shouted the driver. He applied the brakes while the fireman scrambled forward to the footplate. He was just in time. Both men watched in horror as a widening gap opened between Henry and his tender. Henry stopped as soon as he could. The automatic brake halted his tender in the train some way behind. We must drop Henry's fire, said the driver urgently. It will be dangerous to let him boil dry now that we can't get more water from the tender. The fireman agreed. Sorry, old boy, he said to Henry. Just when we got it going nicely too. But if you hadn't banged about so much, you wouldn't have broken your tender coupling. While the fireman dealt with the fire, the driver went back to tell the signalman what had happened. When he returned, he found Henry completely hidden in a huge cloud of black smoke which billowed from beneath his cab. The fireman emerged, choking. Henry's fire set the sleepers alight, he spluttered. You stay here. I'm going to phone the fire brigade. The driver eased Henry clear of the blaze, and then Edward came to take his train on. Henry felt most uncomfortable. Workmen made Henry a temporary coupling. They rejoined him to his tender, and then the driver and fireman lit a new fire and drove him gently home. Edward, who had of course seen everything, told the others. They were careful what they talked about that night. As for Henry, he was touchy on the subject of fires for some time afterwards. But James was quick to notice that from then on, Henry stopped making rude remarks about the colour of fire engines. Deep freeze. Winter had come, and for many days now had held everything in an icy grip. The countryside was frozen hard, trees were white with frost, and icicles hung from bridges and water columns. Mercifully, there was little snow. Too cold for that, thank goodness, shivered James's driver, as he and the fireman huddled on the sheltered side of the cab. James had an open footplate, and every day his crew came to work muffled to the eyebrows in scarves and jerseys. Sometimes water columns froze too, and then the engines could not get the water they needed. But this never happened at the workstation, and one day, when the frost seemed harder than ever, James's driver stopped him beside the water column there. We'll give you a good topping up while we can, he said. There's no telling when we might get some more. James shivered as the icy water cascaded into his tender, but he knew his driver was right. They filled James's tank to the brim because the fireman forgot to tell the driver to turn the tap off. Water overflowed onto James's tender, making him shiver again. Right, said the fireman, jumping down to the footplate. Let's be off. I want to warm myself up shoveling coal. <laughs> we can't go yet, laughed the driver. They haven't finished loading the luggage van. 
Well, I wish they'd hurry, grumbled the fireman, blowing on his hands. I'm frozen from standing on that tender. All engines have a tap called an injector. It allows the driver or fireman to transfer water from the tender to the boiler and is very important. Without it, the water level in the boiler could become too low to make steam properly. They had not gone far before James felt thirsty. I need a drink, please, he said. His driver switched on the injector, but nothing happened. The fireman tried his duplicates, still nothing. I've got such a pain, groaned James. Your injectors failed, said his driver. Blockage in the pipe, most likely. We'll have to stop and deal with your fire. Can't go on without water. Don't set the sleepers on fire, pleaded James. Henry would never let me forget it. The fireman laughed. You'll be all right if we just damp you down, he said. There's no need to throw the fire out, as Henry did. They stopped near a signal box, and James's driver asked the signalman to telephone for help. The work sent a diesel, whom James had never met, to help him. Rescued by a diesel, he snorted disgustedly. It's degrading. I won't go. But he soon changed his mind, because now that his fire was down, his boiler was cooling, and he could feel the icy wind. The diesel was friendly. James was quiet at first, but by the time they reached the works, the diesel had won him over, and the two of them were chatting like old friends. At the works, James's fireman climbed onto the tender. He tried to open the filler cap, but couldn't. There's your answer, James, he said. Your filler cap's frozen solid. That's because the water overflowed. Ice is stopping air from getting into the tank, so the injectors can't work. You'll be all right when the ice melts. He was, and that wasn't all. Thanks to his new friend from the works, even James now admits that diesels can be useful engines too. Patience is a virtue. The thin controller held a letter in his hand. Six little engines watched him anxiously. Do you remember Tally Clin, your twin? He asked Scarloy. He is ill, so his controller is short of an engine. Now I can't spare anyone until Duke is mended, but I want to suggest to him that one of us... Oh, sir, please, sir, cried the engines excitedly. The thin controller held his ears. You can't all go, he laughed. I thought Sir Handel. Oh, sir, said Sir Handel, happily. A few days later, Duke was taken to the works. Sir Handel's excitement grew. I hope he comes back quickly, he said to anyone who would listen. Don't be so impatient, his driver laughed. There's a lot to be done. Your repairs took a long time, remember, and Duke is older than you. The weeks passed, and still Duke didn't come back. Sir Handel became more and more impatient. One day he was waiting at the bottom station when Gordon arrived. I've been invited to Wales, Sir Handel told him importantly, but I can't be spared until Duke is mended. Quite right, said Gordon. It's a great responsibility being indispensable. Gordon says I'm, uh, uh insensible, Sir Handel boasted to the others. They were amused, but not impressed. Summer came and crowds of visitors came to the railway. Sometimes extra coaches were needed to carry them all. One day, Sir Handel's train was fuller than ever. When he reached the top station, he was exhausted. An enormous crowd of people was waiting on the platform for the last train home. They must have come on earlier trains and stayed to picnic by the lake, said the fireman. Never mind, we'll manage. It's all downhill now. But at the station near the waterfall, the platform was full too. We need a shoehorn to get them all in, exclaimed the guard, scratching his head. Still, we'll have to do it somehow. I'll take some with me in Beatrice. The 
passengers had enjoyed their day in the hills and didn't mind standing. They knew it would be only for a short while. The guard always checked tickets at the station by the waterfall. Today it was a long job, and before he had half finished, Sir Handel was growing impatient. An insensible engine like me shouldn't keep Henry waiting, he fumed. Can't be helped, said his driver. Henry will just have to wait. He's kept us at it before now. At last the guard was ready. He blew his whistle, waved his green flag, and turned towards Beatrice. At last we're off, do come along, at last we're off, do come along, Sir Handel snorted impatiently. Quickly the train began to move. The guard tried to get into Beatrice, but her doorway was blocked by passengers. By the time they'd moved to let him in, the train was out of the station and the guard was left standing on the platform. Beatrice tried to stop, but there was no one to put her brakes on. The guard blew his whistle and waved a red flag, but the line curved and Sir Handel couldn't see or hear him. Luckily, a passenger in Beatrice knew what to do. He pressed a button and a buzzer sounded in Sir Handel's cab. His driver braked hard. Now what? he asked the fireman. Go and find out. Maybe we've left someone behind. They had, of course. They soon discovered who. Passengers helped the guard into Beatrice, and after a fast run, the train reached the terminus at the same time as Henry. Sir Handel stopped with a sigh of relief. The guard came to see him. I'm sorry I was impatient, Mr. Guard, said Sir Handel nervously. I didn't want to be late. Insensible engines shouldn't be late, should they? No, agreed the guard, but sensible engines know that patience is a virtue. Remember that next time. I'll try, promised Sir Handel, sadly. Peter Sam and the Prickly Problem Duke returned at last, and Sir Handel went away. The other engines were kept so busy that they didn't have time to miss him. Hedge cutters had been busy too, trimming trees and bushes beside the railway so that passengers could see the view. Each evening Rusty took some trucks up the line and carried away as many cuttings as he could. But he could manage only a few at a time, and as fast as he moved the cuttings, more took their place. It was Peter Sam's turn to take the morning train. The coaches were full, but the rails were dry, and Peter Sam didn't mind the extra load. He puffed happily along, until, just beyond the tunnel, he found that, in the night, a high wind had blown hedge cuttings across the rails. He stopped, and his driver and fireman got down. We'll never get through that lot, exclaimed the fireman. Pooh, scoffed Peter Sam. They're only little branches, nothing to it. We'll simply push them aside. Have it your own way, said his driver. If we stop to clear up properly, we shall be here for ages, and some of the passengers might miss their train at the bottom station. Peter Sam puffed bravely on. He went carefully at first, and the branches slid aside easily. Then came a stretch where the cuttings were brambles. Peter Sam began to regret his boasting. Not only were the thorns prickly, but they caught in each other, and the branches stayed firmly put. Ouch! exclaimed Peter Sam suddenly, and stopped. I can't move, he complained. The fireman looked. It's no good, he said at last. You've got brambles caught in your valve gear, and steam can't get into your cylinders. We shall have to cut you out. Peter Sam shuddered. He shut his eyes and prepared for the worst. The fireman pulled on thick gloves. Then, while he tried to clear what he could, the driver went to ask the guard if he had a knife. Some of the passengers had knives too, and came to help. But even then, the job took longer than expected, and by the time Peter Sam was free, there was no hope of getting the passengers round the lake and back before James's train left. Peter Sam's driver apologised to the passengers, but they said they didn't mind. We enjoyed the adventure, they laughed. The driver telephoned the thin controller. On the way home, they passed Rusty, pulling a long train of trucks. Rusty worked hard, and by afternoon the line was clear for trains to run normally. Peter Sam's front felt uncomfortable for several days. The others laughed and teased him. Take a snowplow next time, they suggested, and they kept asking if he had a sharp knife in his cab. At last Scarloy told them to stop. I really can't think what all the fuss is for, remarked Duncan innocently. They were only little branches after all. Nothing to get prickly about, surely. Pop Special 
During the summer, a party of scouts set up tents in a field beside the line. They bustled about arranging things, but were never too busy to wave to the engines as they passed. They've come for their annual camp, exclaimed Duncan's driver. It's a sort of holiday for them. Their leader has been to see Mr. Hugh, and he says that the boys can work on the railway for us. <laughs> Sounds a funny sort of holiday to me, said Duncan doubtfully. Lots of people do it, continued the driver. The Tallyclin Railway, where Sir Handel has gone, has most of its work done like that. The scouts are going to help us. You know that place near the top station where the ditches are bad and we have to be careful when it's wet? Well, the scouts are going to put that right for us. The engines were pleased because they didn't like having to slow down there in wet or frosty weather. It was anything but frosty at present. Each day the sun shone and it became hotter and hotter, too hot even for holidaymakers to lie on the beach. Every train was full. The scouts were hot too. They rested thankfully as the trains passed, but their cheerful waves became wearier as the week wore on. On the final day of their camp, Duncan toiled uphill with the last train. He was looking forward to a rest under the trees at the top station. As Duncan neared the place where the scouts were working, he whistled to warn them he was coming. Then he saw a figure crossing the line in front of the train. Duncan's driver put a hand on his brake. Steady on, Duncan, he warned. It looks as if the scout's leader wants us to stop for something. Duncan drew gently to a halt, and the leader climbed onto the step of his cab. Is anything wrong? the driver asked anxiously. Not yet, replied the leader, but I'm afraid there might be unless the boys have a drink. Can you drop off some pop or something when you next pass, please? No problem, replied the driver. I'll see the refreshment lady when we reach the top station. But when they got there, the driver came back from the refreshment room with a long face. Not a bottle to be had, he moaned to Duncan. Everyone's as thirsty as those boys, so now what? Duncan didn't know. He thought so hard that he began to feel thirsty himself. Then, suddenly, an idea came to him. Isn't there a shop near the station by the lake, he said. Perhaps the lady there... Of course, interrupted the fireman excitedly. We'll leave the coaches here while Duncan takes something to the boys. We can just get back here before the train is due to leave, but we must hurry. While the station master telephoned to warn the shop lady, Duncan set off. The shop lady met them at the station. I haven't much myself, she said, but the lads are welcome to what there is. A little later, the scouts heard a whistle and Duncan puffed into sight. He stopped beside them and his driver handed down the drinks. The scouts cheered him. Not me, he told them. It was Duncan's idea. So they cheered again and thanked Duncan instead. It's nothing, he said modestly. You're helping us. It's only fair we should help you too. Sir Handel comes home. Sir Handel was given a great welcome when he returned. It was too late for the workmen to unload him that night, so the engines asked if his truck could be put where he could tell them all about his adventures. A real prince and princess came to see us, Sir Handel told them proudly. They rode in a special train. Driver said they were given some books about us, written by someone called the Thin Clergyman, but I didn't really understand that. I do, said Duke. He and the fat clergyman were the ones who found me, and they put me in a book too. Peter Sam was impressed. Did you pull the prince's train, he asked Sir Handel. No, replied Sir Handel, I was spare engine. It poured with rain and I got soaked. I pulled a special wedding train, though. We had to bring the coaches back very early in the morning. I've never been out at that time of day before. Peter Sam told Sir Handel about his tangle with the brambles. Sir Handel laughed. I know what you mean, he said. I had an adventure a bit like that just before I came away. It was a wet day and I didn't want to go out, but driver said I must. Well, we set off. Luckily, the train wasn't very full, so we got on all right, even though it was raining. Then, we stopped at a station. Sir Handel paused dramatically. Go on, urged Peter Sam. Just beyond the station, continued Sir Handel, there was a steep bit and a curve. Well, it was wet, so naturally I was concentrating on getting up the hill. Of course, agreed Reneas gravely. 
As we came round the bend, a tree suddenly seemed to jump out at me. I tried to stop, of course, but my wheels slipped on the wet rails, and I ran smack into the tree. It hurt, I can tell you. It must have done, agreed Duke, and there were sympathetic murmurs from the others. The tree didn't actually hit me in the eye, explained Sir Handel, but driver and fireman made a great fuss about it. Next morning they put a bandage on my forehead and a black patch over one eye. Everyone laughed and said I looked like a pirate. Then I pulled a special train of something called an AGM. They even wrote a piece about me in their magazine. Sir Handel sighed happily. Oh, it was great fun, he said. Did you see my twin, Tally Clin? asked Scarloy. He was in another part of the shed, replied Sir Handel. The other engines told me that he's on the mend, and he'll be back at work soon. He's lucky. He's got a lovely railway. Sir Handel closed his eyes, remembering. All the same, he added, it's good to be home. Duke smiled in the darkness. I know what you mean, he agreed. and the coal. Thomas the tank engine's blue paint sparkled in the sunshine as he puffed happily along his branch line with Annie and Clarabelle. Blue is the only proper colour for an engine, he boasted to the other engines. Oh, I don't know. I like my brown paint, said Toby. I've always been green. I wouldn't want to be any other colour either, added Percy. Blue is the only colour for a really useful engine. Everybody knows that, spluttered Thomas. Percy said no more. He just grinned at Toby and winked. Each day, Percy brings a truck full of coal from the junction for the coal merchants at Farquhar. Next morning, Thomas was resting when Percy arrived. Be careful in this siding, Percy, warned Thomas, as Percy pushed the trucks along the line beside him. These buffers aren't very safe. They... He got no further. As one of the coal trucks passed Thomas, the catch on its door burst open. With a rumble and a crash, an avalanche of coal poured out and piled up around Thomas's wheels. A thick cloud of coal dust arose all around him. A tissue, spluttered Thomas. Help, I'm choking. Get me out. Percy looked worried. Then, as the dust settled, he looked at Thomas and began to laugh. Thomas's smart blue paint was black from smoke box to bunker. Ha ha ha, chuckled Percy. You don't look really useful now. You should see yourself. You look really disgraceful. I am not disgraceful, choked Thomas furiously. You did that on purpose, Percy. Now stop your stupid giggling and get me out. But it was some time before Percy could help. The coal bunker stood behind the buffers which Thomas had said were unsafe. It was only when the coal was shoveled into the bunker that Thomas could be moved. Poor Thomas was filthy. You're not fit to be seen, grumbled the cleaners. It took so long to clean Thomas that he wasn't ready in time for his next train, and Toby had to take Annie and Clarabelle with Henrietta. The cleaners were tired and dirty when they had finished. Thomas was grumpy in the shed that night. Toby thought it was a great joke, but Percy was annoyed with Thomas for thinking that he'd made his paint black on purpose. Who'd have thought it, Percy remarked. Fancy a really useful blue engine like Thomas becoming a disgrace to the Fat Controller's Railway. You wait, Percy, replied Thomas crossly. One day you'll laugh on the other side of your smoke box. 
Pooh, rejoined Percy. I wouldn't have missed all that fun for anything. The feud worsened as time went on. Thomas thought Percy had coal dusted him deliberately, and Percy was cross with Thomas for thinking so. Two days later, Thomas was at the platform when Percy brought his trucks from the junction. Percy arranged them and ran into a siding for a drink before Thomas's train left. The water column stood at the end of the siding with the faulty buffers. As Percy tried to stop, he heard a cracking sound and to his horror found that he couldn't. The buffers didn't stop him either. Oh, uh, wailed Percy. Help! The buffers broke and Percy ran into the coal bunker with a thud. Coal flew everywhere and when the dust had settled, Percy had disappeared beneath a thick black cloak. Thomas watched from the platform. As the crash died away, the signal arm dropped and Thomas moved off, laughing as he went. Percy was furious and he spent the rest of the day wondering how to pay Thomas out. The Runaway Percy was soon mended, but one morning Thomas woke feeling ill. The fat controller sent him to the big station to see if they could make him better there, but it was no use. Edward must take you to the works, the fat controller told him. Then he went to see Duck. I want you to go and help Percy and Toby while Thomas is ill, he said. Donald and Douglas will do your work here until Thomas comes back. Duck was delighted. He knew Percy already, and it wasn't long before he'd made friends with Toby, Terence and Bertie. Percy, who was still cross with Thomas, was glad to have someone new to talk to. Even Annie and Clarabel were impressed. Such nice manners, they told each other. It really is a pleasure to go out with him. They soon made Duck welcome, and he laughed when they told him how Thomas had once left their guard behind at the junction. When Thomas came back, Annie and Clarabel told him how well Duck had managed. Though Thomas was jealous at first, he was so pleased to be home that he soon forgot it. But he didn't forget the affair with the coal. Percy was careful to keep out of his way. The works had left Thomas's handbrake very stiff. It made his brakes seem as if they were on, when in fact they weren't and Thomas's driver and fireman soon learnt to be extra careful. But one day Thomas's fireman was ill and a relief man took his place. At the junction Thomas ran round Annie and Clarabel. While his driver chatted to the station master on the platform the fireman fastened the coupling. The driver had told him about Thomas's brake but unluckily he had forgotten. When he had finished with the coupling, he joined the driver and station master on the platform. Thomas simmered happily. In the distance, Henry appeared. Not long now, thought Thomas. At that moment, Thomas felt his wheels begin to move. He tried to stop, but he couldn't without his driver and fireman. He tried to whistle a warning, but he couldn't do that either. The guard shouted from the platform, but that did no good. The guard, driver and the fireman were all stranded and the passengers were left on the platform staring. Thomas, Annie and Clarabel gathered speed out of the station. The empty coaches shrieked as they rounded the curve, but Thomas, with plenty of steam, kept on going. The signalman at the junction soon realised what had happened and sent a message along the line. An inspector prepared to stop the runaway at the station near the airfield where Harold the helicopter stood ready in case of emergency. But Thomas was still going much too fast. Quickly the inspector climbed aboard Harold and they took off. I must get there in time, I must, he whirred anxiously. Below Thomas was tiring. I need to stop, I need to stop, he panted wearily. Annie and Clarabel held back as they went uphill. As they neared the station, Thomas saw Harold land and the inspector run towards the platform where he stood waiting. This time Thomas entered the station slowly enough for the inspector to act. 
Running beside the train, he judged his moment, jumped and scrambled into Thomas's cab. Then he put the brake hard on. With a sigh of relief, Thomas stopped. The inspector mopped his brow. Phew, he remarked. Wearily, Thomas agreed with him. Better late than never. Workmen were mending the viaduct on the main line. The arches needed strengthening, but the fat controller did not want to close the railway while the work was done, and so repairs took a long time. The engines had to take great care when crossing the viaduct, and the delay often made them late at the junction. Thomas was cross. Time's time, he grumbled. Why should I keep my passengers waiting while Henry and James dawdle about all day on viaducts? Don't blame me, snorted Henry one day. If we hurried across the viaduct, it might collapse, and then you'd have no passengers at all. What would you do then, eh? Run my trains on time for one thing, retorted Thomas, and hurried away before Henry could answer. At the top station, Bertie was timed to arrive just after Thomas. His passengers soon found that instead of going straight from Bertie to their train, they were having to wait until Thomas arrived. Late again, remarked Bertie one day as Thomas panted wearily in ten minutes after time. I thought you could go fast, Thomas. It's time we had another race. I reckon I could beat you now. Thomas went bluer than ever and let off steam loudly. Rubbish, he hissed fiercely. I'd still beat you any day. It's those mainline engines. They dither about on their viaduct and then blame the fat controller's workmen. It's just an excuse for laziness, if you ask me. One day, James was later than ever at the junction. I'm sorry, Thomas, he puffed as he came breathlessly to the platform. I was held up at the big station, and the viaduct made it worse. It's lucky for you I'm a guaranteed connection, snorted Thomas. He puffed importantly away, leaving James at a loss for words. Peep, peep, whistled Thomas at every station. Get in quickly, please. The passengers did their best, but Thomas soon found that he couldn't save much time. As they neared the tunnel, Thomas thought he saw a flash of red on the road beside the line. That looks like Bertie, he said to himself, but Bertie should have got to Farquhar ages ago. It was Bertie. Thomas stopped as close by as he could. What's the matter? he asked. I feel dreadful, mourned Bertie, all upset inside, and driver says he can't make me better. Thank goodness you're late. Can you take my passengers, please? They'll never get home otherwise. Of course, agreed Thomas. Thankfully, the passengers climbed into Annie and Clarabel, and after promising Bertie that he would send for help from the next station, Thomas set off again. Already he was feeling much more cheerful. All the passengers reached home safely, and when Bertie was better, he came to thank Thomas. I'm sorry I teased you about being late, he said. That's all right, said Thomas. I'm glad I could help. Perhaps being late isn't such a bad thing, after all. Drip Tank One evening, Percy was bringing empty stone trucks from the harbour. He was tired of his quarrel with Thomas and wanted to be friends again. He had had a good day and was feeling extra pleased with himself. He was so busy thinking how he would tell Thomas and Toby about his expert handling of the trucks that he forgot to keep a good lookout. Too late he saw a broken branch hanging over the line straight in front of him. Ooh, uh, he groaned. He tried to stop but his brakes wouldn't hold him. Ouch! he exclaimed a moment later. The branch hit his smoke box, broke away and crashed to the ground. Percy was more startled than hurt, but his front was still sore when they reached the shed. It's your own fault, said Thomas unsympathetically. You should keep a better lookout. I've no patience with you. Pooh! retorted Percy huffily. He forgot his good resolution and talked to Toby for the rest of the evening. Percy didn't speak to Thomas the next day either. I say, Toby, he said in the shed that evening, what's a drip, do you know? 
Toby pondered. It's when rain comes through a hole in your cab and fireman hasn't got time to mend it, he decided at last. That's silly, objected Percy. I heard a boy on the platform call his friend one this afternoon. I'm sure he couldn't have come through a hole in my cab, he added earnestly. Thomas was tired of being ignored. That's different, he interrupted loftily. The boy just thought his friend was being a coward, or silly, or a spoil sport. Percy thought about this. So if, he suggested reflectively, if you stopped me from doing something nice, would you be a drip, Thomas? You're the drip, answered Thomas crossly. Now go to sleep like a sensible engine and stop talking nonsense. Percy was offended. Instead of going to sleep, he became even more determined to pay Thomas out. Next day, Henry's train was late at the junction. When Thomas set out along the valley, he was trying to make up for lost time. Suddenly, there was a loud bang, and something hard hit the bottom of his left-hand water tank. <coughs> Ouch! exclaimed Thomas, and stopped. As he did so, he felt water splashing cold against his wheels. One of your side rods has broken, said his driver. It swung up and punctured your tank. We'll have to get help. At Farquhar, Percy was shunting. The station master came up. Leave those trucks, please, Percy, he said. Thomas has got a hole in his water tank. There's water dripping everywhere, and he can't get home on his own. Percy was still cross with Thomas. I won't go, he said. Thomas called me a drip. Let him jolly well stay there and drip himself. But what about Annie and Clarabel and the passengers, reminded Percy's driver. Do they deserve to stay out all night too? Percy was sorry at once. I forgot them, he said. We must rescue them in case they turn into drips too. He hurried away. He found Thomas near the river. Everyone was glad to see him, and the passengers thanked him for coming. I'm sorry I was rude, said Thomas, as Percy helped him back to the shed. That tank of mine turned me into a bigger drip than we expected, didn't it? Can we be friends again, please? Percy was delighted to agree. excited. The diesels at Yon Works, he announced, say that on the other railway there are things called high-speed trains. They have a diesel engine at each end and can go at a hundred and twenty-five miles an hour. Gordon snorted. An engine at each end, he said scornfully. There's only one of me, but I bet I can go as fast as those smelly boxes on wheels. Probably faster, he added. The others said nothing. They had heard Gordon's boasting before. Gordon was still bragging the next morning. Speed's nothing to me, he said. Why, one of my Doncaster cousins went at a hundred and twenty-six miles an hour. I'll show these diesels a thing or two. Just you wait and see. He puffed grandly towards the station. Gordon normally pulled the express, though Henry, James or Bear helped if Gordon was ill or away. Many visitors came to see the Fat Controller's Railway. They often used the express, so it was usually full and heavy. There had been frost during the night, and now the weather was wet and sleety. Sleet settled on the rails, making an icy film across their surface. The carriages of the express stood under the cover of the station roof, but when Gordon was coupled to them, his cab and front end had to stand outside. He grew colder and colder. 
beholder as he waited for the guard to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. Come on, he shivered impatiently. Let's get started. At last Gordon heard the whistle. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, he shouted as he tried to pull quickly away. But his wheels slipped on the icy rails. The sudden movement made water in his boiler surge forward and Gordon's driver could not shut off steam. Gordon moved a yard and slithered to a standstill, held back by the heavy train. His wheels spun furiously, but neither Gordon nor his train budged an inch. Help! Help! wailed Gordon despairingly, but nobody could. His wheels spun until his rods ached, but he could do nothing to stop them. His driver tried every trick he knew. An inspector came and tried some more, but it was no good. The fat controller came to see what the fuss was about. He said several things to Gordon, but Gordon was making so much noise that he couldn't hear them. Sparks showered from the rails, but Gordon's wheels went on spinning. It was a quarter of an hour before Gordon had used up all his steam. Reduced pressure allowed the driver to close the regulator, and with a deep sigh of relief, Gordon felt his wheels stop turning. The silence was amazing. Donald came to take Gordon to the shed, and Henry came to pull the express. When the train had gone, workmen had to replace the rails where Gordon had been standing, because his spinning wheels had worn deep grooves in them. The shed was empty. Donald tactfully remembered another job, and left Gordon on his own. But that night Gordon heard a whisper from close by. Did you hear, it hissed, how Gordon went for a spin today? There was a quiet chuckle. Gordon seethed in silence. High-speed engines are all very well, the whisper went on, but Gordon ought to know by now that he's supposed to move his train too. Gordon snorted disgustedly, and with a gasp the whisperer subsided into silence. Smokescreen Gordon was feeling stuffed up. It's the coal, Gordon, explained his fireman. It's clogging up your tube something awful, but we'll have to make do with it, for there's nothing else. Why not have a good sneeze, Gordon, suggested Henry, thinking of the time when he'd punished some boys for dropping stones on him. That will clear your tubes. Certainly not, replied Gordon with dignity. The fat controller wouldn't approve. He didn't like your sneeze, I seem to remember. Next day, Gordon was nervous as he backed onto the express. At least I shan't slip today, he thought, but I suppose they'll laugh at me again if I don't keep time. He needn't have worried. By the time he reached the junction, he was running nicely, and as he approached Edward's station, Gordon's fireman began to make up the fire. Let's get a good run at the hill while you've got steam to do it, he said. I don't trust this low-grade coal. At the station, a party of wedding guests, all in their best clothes, were standing on the platform. As Gordon swooshed through, running hard for the hill, smoke from the newly made fire streamed from his funnel. He disappeared into the distance and left a black smoke screen settling over the station. It covered everything, wedding guests and all, in a coat of soot and smuts. Waves to Gordon became shaking fists, and the wedding party hurried angrily to the station master's office. At the end of the line, an inspector came to see Gordon. His message from the fat controller was short, but not sweet. It's not fair, Gordon complained to Boko. How could I help that smoke? It's not my fault the coal's dirty. Never mind, said Boko encouragingly. Where would I be if I got upset every time someone called me smelly? Anyhow, soot's good for the garden, my driver says. But not for new clothes, muttered Gordon. Gordon was extra careful on the way home, but it wasn't his lucky day. The fat controller had broken a journey to the other railway to apologise to the people at Edwards Station. He had done his best and was waiting for another train when Gordon came by. 
As the express thundered through, a cloud of something flew from it and landed on the fat controller's new top hat. When Gordon reached the big station, there was another message waiting for him. The fat controller says, announced the inspector, that Gordon blew ashes on his top hat as he passed Edward's station. Gordon was horrified. Whoosh! he exclaimed indignantly. I did not. I was being extra careful. I'm sure the fat controller can't be right, put in Gordon's fireman. I can't help it, said the inspector. That's what he says, so there it is. He will speak to Gordon when he gets home. Gordon went sadly back to the shed. Fire escape. Driver says the fat controller's coming home tomorrow, said James a week later. Gordon grunted. He wasn't anxious to see the fat controller. I must do well today, he said to himself as he waited to start the express. A good run today might help if the fat controller hears about it. Things did not begin well, though. Thanks to a last-minute passenger, they were late starting, which meant that Gordon missed his path at the junction and was delayed there, too. But, with a clear run after that, they flashed through Edward Station going splendidly. They were halfway up the hill when there was a clatter beneath Gordon's cab. Suddenly, he felt a blast of cold air in his middle, as if there were a gap between his boiler and cab. Oof! he gasped. What's happened? The fireman looked at his fire. There was a gaping hole in the middle where the fire bars had collapsed and a large part of the fire had disappeared. You've lost part of your fire, Gordon, the fireman explained. What a place to do it. Already Gordon was feeling weaker. Without a full fire, his steam pressure and speed fell quickly. But his driver knew what to do. Find the biggest piece of coal you can and put it across the hole, he told the fireman. That will stop some of the cold air from getting in, and we'll be able to hold steam better. But hurry, or the hill will beat us. The fireman hurried. A large lump of coal lay near the front of the tender. Quickly, he moved it into place with his shovel and a long steel bar. Gordon felt better at once. Now build the fire gently round the edges, said the driver. And, as the fireman did so, the driver adjusted Gordon's controls to make the best use of his steam. Right, Gordon, he said when the fireman had finished. Now it's up to you. Gordon tried his hardest, but it was tough going. I must do it, I must do it, he told himself as he pounded up the hill. He had stuck here once before and was determined not to fail again. Poor Gordon was getting very breathless. I will do it, I will do it, he panted, but he was careful not to pant too loudly in case he blew away what was left of his fire. He shut his eyes and struggled on. At last Gordon felt that the slope was easier to climb. Cautiously he opened one eye. Yes, he was nearly at the top. I've done it, I've done it, he gasped triumphantly. The fireman mopped his brow. That was splendid, Gordon, he said, and now you deserve a rest. A signalman turned them into a goods loop and telephoned the works for a pilot engine to be prepared. While they waited, the passengers got out and told Gordon what a useful engine he was. Boko was at the works to help, and the two engines finished the journey without further trouble. At the end of the line, the fat controller was waiting for them. To Gordon's surprise, he was smiling. Thank you, Boko, he said, and thank you, Gordon, for a splendid effort. I am pleased with your work today, though certain, um, other things leave much to... But just then, a whistle blew, and the fat controller had to hurry to his carriage. Once again, poor Gordon was left in suspense. Gordon proves his point. One day, Gordon reached the big station on the mainland to find the platform crowded. It's a rail tour, explained his driver, going along the coastline to Carlisle, I think. The station master came up. Can you help, he asked. These rail tour people are stuck because their train has failed. Could Gordon take them in his train, please? Gordon's driver laughed. You'll have to hold him back, eh, Gordon? He said. But you need the fat controller's permission. 
And what about our return train? The fat controller agreed at once, and then the station master rang the shed. What can you substitute for Gordon's Express, he asked. There's the high-speed train that came yesterday, they suggested. It's only got one power car working, but it should keep the fat controller's timing. Philippa, she preferred Pip for short, and Emma were delighted to stand in for Gordon. Pip's cooling system was faulty, making her hot and bothered, but Emma didn't mind doing all the work. They felt honoured to visit the fat controller's railway. James, following a little later with a stopping train, was surprised when the signalman at the station beyond the works came up. That high-speed diesel's failed, he said. Go gently until you reach it, push it to the next loop, and then go round in front to pull it home. Phew, remarked James, but what about the express passengers? They won't want to make our stops. Too bad, said the signalman. Better that way than your people missing their stations. James found the failed train about two miles in front. He pushed it to the next station and then got ready to pull. I'm sorry I can't help, apologized Emma, who was in front, but we are special lightweight coaches. That's lucky, said James, who was already feeling puffed. But he found it easier than he expected. Once the train was moving, the coaches followed smoothly. As for the passengers, if they wondered about the extra stops, they didn't complain. The fat controller met them. I'm sorry we're late, sir, said James. That's all right, James, said the fat controller. I'm pleased with you. You have saved an awkward situation. Now, please make Pip and Emma welcome in the shed while I arrange their journey home. The other engines were quiet at first, but they soon found the diesels friendly, and before long they were all laughing together. James was glad Gordon was away. He might, he thought, so easily have said something to upset them. Gordon came home next day. The fat controller forgave him for his smokescreen and said that he was sorry for thinking his spoiled top hat had been Gordon's fault. It had, he explained, been a steward emptying an ashtray from a carriage window. Now, Gordon, he continued, while you were in Carlisle, we borrowed a high-speed train. This has failed, and I want you to take her passengers home. He paused and smiled. Show them how we do things, eh? I certainly will promised Gordon. Right, said Gordon's driver as they backed towards the train. Today, Gordon, my lad, you can have the run of your life. He did too. Douglas was waiting to pull Pip and Emma home when Gordon passed. Boop, 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 whistled Gordon proudly, and with a swish and a roar he was gone. Pip and Emma watched enviously. Douglas chuckled. Oh, he said to himself, Yon Gordon's eye a high-speed engine, but it's me who's pulling the high-speed train. and the lorry. Mavis is a diesel engine belonging to the Farquhar Quarry Company. She is in charge of the stone trucks at the quarry, and when Toby is busy, or there are too many trucks for him to manage by himself, she is allowed to bring a loaded train down to Farquhar. She enjoys this because the journey gives her a chance to stretch her wheels. Besides, she sometimes finds it dull up at the quarry with no one to talk to but trucks. For most of the way, the line runs beside a road. Mavis is always very careful, especially at the place where Thomas once had an argument with a policeman. A road crosses the line here, and though there are warning signs, some of the cars and lorries come round the corner much too fast. They make Mavis nervous. 
There'll be an accident one day, Mavis's driver often says as they pass the place, and she feels sure he is right. One day, Mavis was late. The trucks had been in all the wrong places, and she had to waste time sorting them out. As she came down the line, she felt them surge against her. Stop pushing, she growled. They neared the crossing, and Mavis saw a lorry coming towards them. He'll stop when he sees us, she thought. But she couldn't know the lorry driver was new to the island. The last thing he expected to see was a train. Much too fast, the lorry approached the corner. Too late, the driver realized it was sharper than he expected. He swerved, and at that moment he saw Mavis halfway across the road. He braked hard and swung the steering wheel, but he was too late. The lorry's front bumper just caught Mavis's cowcatcher, and the lorry left the road and skidded into a ditch. With a loud crash, it fell onto its side. Mavis, who had already stopped, watched in horror. Out, she exclaimed. That hurt. I didn't push him over, she cried in alarm. Her driver laughed and jumped down. No one's blaming you, he said, but I hope the lorry driver is all right. The lorry's right-hand door was deep in the ditch, but now a figure could be seen struggling to climb out at the other side. Mavis's driver went to help. Is that a train? the man demanded. It certainly is, laughed Mavis's driver. You must be new here not to have seen us before. Mavis's front was bent, but she wasn't badly hurt. Her owner sent her to be mended and asked the fat controller if he could borrow Toby while she was away. What about the trucks down here, sir? Toby asked anxiously. The fat controller nodded. I'm afraid it will mean more work for you, Percy, he said, but Toby's side plates make him the only engine who can go up there. You remember what happened to Thomas, don't you? And with that, they had to be content. Toby's Seaside Holiday The Fat Controller first met Toby and Henrietta a long time ago when he was on holiday in East Anglia. Later, when their line was closed, the Fat Controller heard about it and brought them to Sodor. Before that, Toby had worked at a harbour with several of his brothers. The harbour had been busy and the engines were kept bustling about but Toby never really had a chance to exercise his pistons properly until he had his own line to run on. One day, Toby was resting alone in the shed at Farquhar. That morning, Percy had been talking about the harbour at Knapford. Toby remembered the old days when he had worked at a harbour too. I'm too old now to dash about like I did then, he thought. Backwards and forwards all day long, between the harbour and the big station, with never any chance of a holiday. But I did go to the seaside once, he remembered. For a while, anyway. His driver and fireman had been so excited when they came to work one day. We've been promised a trip to the seaside, they said. What do you mean? asked Toby. There's a seaside village near here, explained the driver, where they have a festival each year. Lots of people come to it, and one of the organisers thinks it would be a good idea to have a display of engines at the station as an extra attraction. And you, Toby, are to be one of them. Toby went to the shed at the big station. He was given new paint, a new bell, and his brasswork was polished until his driver could see himself in it. You haven't looked so smart for years, he said. I nearly didn't recognise you. They set out for the junction where the branch line to the village began. As they arrived, a train came in from the branch. The engine was younger than Toby, but he was dirty, his rods clanked, and steam leaked from everywhere. The poor engine, said Toby. Can I help pull his next train to the seaside, please? The station master agreed, so Toby was coupled in front. Festival time is the best time of the year, the other engine said. Lots of extra trains and visitors. I expect you'll be able to stand on the long carriage siding. They soon reached the seaside station where the station master came out to meet them. He was surprised to see Toby. He stared, frowned and went away shaking his head. Next day, Toby was excited. He woke early and saw the sea sparkling in the distance. White birds wheeled and swooped overhead, making loud, mewing noises. I wonder what they are, thought Toby. I must ask my driver when he comes. 
bus, his crew arrived looking glum. It's all off, Toby, his driver said. They say there's nowhere for you to stand. But what's wrong with where I am, wailed Toby. I'm not in anybody's way here. It's just an excuse, I reckon, said Toby's driver, lowering his voice. The real trouble is you're too smart, Toby. They're afraid you'll show their branch line up. Just then, a door banged. Toby jumped. Wake up, Toby, smiled his driver. Time to get back to work. Toby sighed as he moved from the shed. Well, I did get to the seaside, he murmured, even if it wasn't for long. But I think the fat controller would have managed all that festival business much better. Bullstrode. A few days later, Percy was shunting in the yard at Farquhar when the station master came up. Leave those trucks, please, Percy, he said. There's an emergency down at the harbour. The fat controller wants you to go and sort it out straight away. But Toby can't, began Percy. Never mind that, the station master said. The fat controller needs you double quick. Leave us to worry about the shunting. He hurried away to make the arrangements. Bullstrode was a barge used for carrying stone. He was a disagreeable barge. Nothing was ever right for him, and he grumbled unceasingly. Trucks grumbled too, but they went a patch on Bullstrode. Come on, come on, shouted Bullstrode rudely one morning. Why aren't you trucks where you should be? How can I be loaded if you dawdle about up there, eh? There's no engine, and we can only go where we're put, retorted the trucks crossly. You're in the wrong place, not us. They argued for some time, but it made no difference. Bullstrode was in the wrong place, and he was not due to leave until the next day, but he wasn't going to let a little thing like that stop him complaining. When Percy arrived, Bullstrode was sulking, and the trucks were annoyed with him. Our stone is for Bullstrode, they said. Please put us into the siding so that we can load him up and be rid of him as soon as possible. The line slopes down to the harbour. Percy pulled the trucks a little way up the hill, clear of the points. As he stopped, one of the truck's brakes slipped on. When Percy began to push, the truck started with a jerk and a coupling broke. Four loose trucks, heavy with stone, gathered speed. Help! Help! they wailed. A shunter bravely tried to stop them, but only broke his pole. The trucks rattled along the quay, straight towards Bullstrode, unsuspecting at the end. Bullstrode heard a rattle and a shout or two, but he could see nothing. The first he knew of anything wrong was when four loaded stone trucks shot, one by one, off the end of the quay to bury themselves in his hold. Oof! he exclaimed. But anything else was lost in a gurgle as the trucks burst a hole in his hull and water began to pour in. Bullstrode experienced an awful sinking feeling. Save me, he spluttered. I'm drowning. But Bullstrode didn't drown. As chance would have it, the tide was out, so he did not go right under the water. The trucks were upset at losing some of their friends, but were very little bothered about Bullstrode. Nothing but a nuisance he was, they said to each other, always barging in and moaning about not being loaded fast enough. They sniggered. This time he got his load faster than he bargained for. Serves him right, if you ask us. Percy was kept busy for some time afterwards clearing up the mess. When the remains of the trucks had been lifted out of the water, he took them to the scrapyard while workmen rescued what stone they could. As for Bullstrode, when everything else had been cleared, his remains were towed to a nearby beach where they could do no harm. Now children play happily among the wreckage. If Bullstrode is still grumbling, as I expect he is, the children take no notice. Toby takes the road. While Percy was away, Terence had done all the shunting in the yard. Adaptable, he boasted. That's what my owner says I am. Go anywhere, do anything, that's me. You take my advice and scrap your rails. Broaden your outlook, like me. Pooh, said Percy. Me, plough a field. I prefer to stay on my rails, thank you. Steam engines did plough once upon a time, Terence chuckled, and ran on roads. 
the engines remembered Trevor and had to admit that Terence was right. Repairs to Mavis took longer than expected and Toby became used to trundling off to the quarry each morning. Because of Toby's small water tank, his driver and fireman had arranged with the quarry manager that they should bring loaded trucks down to Farquhar at lunchtime instead of later in the day. It saved time too, for Toby would otherwise have needed an extra journey to fill his water tank. This way he delivered the trucks and got water in one visit. Time passed and the weather became colder with hard frosts during the night. They didn't worry Toby. His fire kept him nice and warm and he puffed happily to and fro, arranging the trucks, taking them down to the yard and bringing back empty ones. One night it was particularly cold. The ground froze solid and even Toby felt chilly. Brrr, he shivered as he left the shed and set out, light engine along the line towards the quarry. When the ground freezes, it swells. At the road crossing where Mavis had had her accident, the frost had swollen earth in the ruts beside the rail so much that Toby's wheels were lifted clean off the track. There was a crunching noise, a rumbling, and Toby began to shudder. He was horrified. Oh, uh, he exclaimed, what's happening? The line here curves away towards the quarry, but Toby, with no rails to guide his wheels round, simply went straight on. Toby was not going fast. Whoa there, Toby, said his driver at once, and put on the brakes as hard as he dared. Shakily, Toby came to a stop with all six wheels firmly on the roadway. Oh, dear, he said, looking at the grass verge in front of him. Now what? His fireman jumped down. No problem, he said. With care, we can have you back on the rails in no time. I don't see how, said Toby, sadly. Directed by the fireman, the driver carefully reversed Toby along the ruts his wheels had just made. At last, with a thud and a jolt, Toby felt the rails safely beneath his wheels once more. He heaved a sigh of relief. Well done, Toby, said his fireman. Now I'll spread a few hot ashes from your fire along there so that it doesn't happen again. Then we can get safely up to the quarry and no one will be any wiser. But they reckoned without the fat controller. When Mavis was home after being mended, he came to see the engines. What's this I hear, Toby, he asked. Trying to be a traction engine, were you? Toby blushed but the fat controller wasn't cross. Toby told him about Terence. The fat controller laughed. <laughs> if I were you, he said, I should leave the roads to what they were made for. You stay on the rails, you'll find them much more comfortable. Toby the tram engine was quick to agree. eggs. The bridge across the river needs repair, the fat controller told the engines. I shall have to make a weight limit across it for a while. Percy and Daisy will be all right, and Toby too, but Thomas is too heavy. Thomas looked anxious. How would you like to go and help Edward, suggested the fat controller. Can Annie and Clarabel come, asked Thomas. The fat controller shook his head. They'll be needed here, I'm afraid, he said. Daisy can't carry all your passengers on her own. Percy promised to look after Annie and Clarabel, but they were sorry to see Thomas go. To cheer Thomas up, Edward took him to see Bill and Ben, the twin engines who lived at the China Clay Harbour. Oh dear, not another blue engine, said Bill cheekily. First Edward, then Donald and Douglas, and now... 
Don't forget Gordon, interrupted Ben. He came here once by mistake, so he said. I don't think he enjoyed it much, he added innocently. The twins both chuckled, remembering. No, but seriously, Edward, said Bill. Why doesn't the fat controller paint engines a proper colour? Like us, for instance. Thomas let off steam indignantly. Let me tell you, he began. All right, you two, laughed Edward. Go and move those trucks or there won't be room for any more. Bill and Ben, unabashed, went off happily. You just don't have to take them too seriously, explained Edward. Thomas smiled ruefully. I wish I knew how you deal with them, he said. Near the harbour, the line crossed a lane. The crossing had no gates. The lane led to a farm which made butter and supplied eggs and milk to shops in the town. One morning, the farmer had difficulty starting his lorry. He did it at last, but the lorry jerked along in fits and starts. The farmer was worried about his load of milk and butter and eggs. That milk will be churned to butter soon, he muttered to himself as he neared the level crossing. The lorry lurched across the rails. The back wheels were just clear when its engine made a noise like a tired sheep and stopped. The back of the lorry was still jutting out over the railway line. The farmer struggled to start it again, but it would not go. He had just got down to telephone for help when he heard a train approaching. Thomas wasn't going fast. When he saw the lorry, he set his brakes hard, but he couldn't stop. He hit the lorry with a loud crash. The force of the blow spun the lorry round. Splintered wood flew everywhere, and eggs, butter and milk were catapulted over Thomas. Ugh! he exclaimed and stopped. Just look at my poor old lorry, said the farmer, emerging from behind the hedge where he'd been sheltering. What a way to make an omelette! The driver made sure that Thomas wasn't hurt, then stood back and surveyed the mess. He began to laugh. It's not funny, said Thomas crossly. An egg yolk trickled down his nose and burst on his buffer. You're not standing where I am, said his driver. You look just like a scrambled egg, Thomas. Well, if a scrambled egg feels as sticky and wet as I do, then it's very uncomfortable, said Thomas. Please clean me. Both driver and fireman tried hard, but the heat of Thomas's boiler had cooked the eggs and they were stuck fast. Sorry, Thomas, said his driver at last. We can't block the line any longer. We shall have to go on. At the end of the line, Thomas was taken to Bill and Ben's yard to be cleaned. The twins were there. Hello, said Ben. What's this? Must be a new engine, said Bill. Ben inspected the arrival carefully. No, Bill, he said. That's not a new engine. It's Thomas. But it's our colour, Ben, and Thomas doesn't think our colour is proper for an engine. They heard a grinding noise. Are your joints stiff, Bill? asked Ben. But it wasn't Bill's joints. It was Thomas gnashing his teeth. What a picture. It took a long time to clean Thomas properly, and the twins kept teasing him until Edward told them to stop. A party of railway enthusiasts is coming soon, he said. I shan't bring them unless you behave. Bill and Ben were excited. Enthusiasts always made a fuss of them and took their photographs. When? they squeaked in unison. Edward smiled and winked at Thomas. Next week, he said but not if you don't behave. Bill and Ben promised that they would. Is it next week, they asked Thomas each morning. Thomas enjoyed keeping the twins in suspense. Next week never comes, he would answer mysteriously. Bill and Ben went worried. They kept urging their crews to polish them. What's the hurry, they laughed. The enthusiasts aren't going to eat their breakfasts off you, you know. No, Bill whispered, but they might if we were Thomas. The twins thought this a huge joke. It was lucky that Edward and Thomas weren't there to hear it. At last the day came, and the drivers and firemen agreed to give the engines an extra polish. They were sparkling when Thomas arrived with a special train. Many of the enthusiasts had notebooks, and almost all had cameras. Bill and Ben didn't know which way to look, but they loved it. Then the visitors queued up for a ride in either Bill or Ben's cab. 
Their cabs were low and several visitors forgot to duck, but they didn't seem to mind. The enthusiast's visit was almost over when a shunter came running up. A ship needs moving before the tide goes down, he said. One of you see to it, please. Ben went at once, and most of the visitors went too, to watch. Only one man stayed. He had a camera which took instant pictures. Just one more, he kept saying. Soon, even Bill tired of him. The photographer screwed his camera to a tripod and pointed it at Bill. This is it, he chortled. What a picture. Ben's fireman ran up to them. Ben needs help, he said. The ship's going aground, and he can't move it on his own. Right, Bill, said his driver. We can't wait any longer. He turned a tap, and with a hiss and a roar, Bill vanished in a cloud of steam. At that moment, the photographer pressed the button. When the steam cleared, Bill was hurrying off to help his twin. The photographer peeled the cover from his instant picture, looked at it, and threw it down in disgust. Quickly, the engines were coupled together. When I say heave, heave, instructed Ben. One, two, three, heave! Come on, come on, puffed the engines. The cable tightened and stretched. At last, with a shudder, the ship slid off the mud and, towed by the engines, glided into deeper water. Bill's driver found the discarded photograph on the floor. All it showed was a cloud of steam with, very dimly, Bill's funnel at the top. He showed it to Bill. What a picture, remarked Bill, to no one in particular. Trevor helps out. Trevor, the traction engine, was feeling depressed. He couldn't breathe properly. Your boiler needs mending, said his owner, the vicar, but I can't afford it at present. One morning, the vicarage telephone rang. The vicar answered it and then hurried out to see Trevor. You may be a bit under the weather, but you can manage this, he said. The farmer has a tree down and wants you to saw it up for him. When Trevor had steam, they went to the farm and set to work in a field near the railway, trying to clear the fallen tree. Thomas passed by with Edward's coaches. He whistled cheerfully. Edward liked trucks and had been delighted to let Thomas have his coaches for a while. When Edward passed later that morning, he was pulling trucks with a sort of tent over them. These were specially for carrying china clay. The men called them hoods. Why hoods? Thomas had asked Bill and Ben. The hoods are those things like tents, explained Bill. They keep the clay dry, added Ben. Wet clay goes in tanks. But to Trevor, they were simply trucks. He was enjoying himself. The only thing he liked better than sawing logs was giving children rides. He chunted happily as the pile of logs beside him grew. Edward returned with some empty trucks. As he passed the place where Trevor was working, the line seemed to wobble under him. That feels like a loose rail, he thought. We'd better tell the maintenance people. At the harbour, Edward exchanged the empty trucks for full ones and set off for the junction again. Trevor dozed. The wind had dropped and it was comfortable in the autumn sunshine. It seemed no time at all before he heard Edward coming back. Trevor whistled a cheerful greeting. He was watching Edward and so did not see one of the trucks, six from the end, sink, jump and shudder just at the place Edward had felt a weakness in the line that morning. Sparks flew, a truck wheel jammed and with a crack a coupling broke. The last six trucks and the guard's van lurched, bumped and stopped. The guard, safe in his van, blew his whistle. Edward, far in front, didn't hear it and hurried on without realising what had happened. But Trevor was closer to the guard's van than Edward. He heard the whistle and looked back to see the trucks lying at strange angles on the track. Peep, 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 he whistled in horror. Stop, Edward, stop. Edward heard that. It's Trevor, he cried anxiously. What's wrong? We'd better stop and see, said his driver. Fireman climbed onto the tender. Phew, he exclaimed. Look, it's not Trevor, it's us. The guard went to protect the train, the fireman went to the farmhouse to telephone for help, and the breakdown gang soon cleared the line. That evening, the fat controller came to see Trevor. Thank you, Trevor, he said.
I've heard about your boiler, and because you saved a nasty situation, you're to go to my works to be mended. Would you like that? Oh, sir, said Trevor, thank you. That would be lovely. Down the drain. China clay is not quarried as other minerals are. It is washed out of the ground with strong hoses. Then the mixture of clay and water has to settle and be dried before Bill and Ben can take it away. Part of the line which the twins use to reach the China clay workings runs near the sea. There is a hollow in the land just here which often floods after heavy rain. Local people call this hollow the drain. The autumn gales which had brought down the farmer's tree for Trevor to cut up were also causing rough seas and high tides. When rain came too, the engine crews looked gloomy. A really high tide now, said Ben's driver, could make real trouble at the drain. But though pools of water lay on either side of the line, they grew no larger. Bill and Ben puffed happily to and fro, replacing loaded hoods with empty ones. They forgot about the drain. Then the rain began again, and the wind strengthened. As the engines went to the clay pits that morning, their drivers noticed that the water in the drain was rising. While Bill arranged the empty trucks, Ben prepared to leave with a train of full ones. At the drain, he found that the water was level with the top of the rails. Come on, said Ben bravely. We must get through, if only to get help for Bill. Go back, go back, the wind seemed to shriek. Ben took no notice. He was halfway over when the rising tide, whipped into a huge wave by the wind, swept across the line. Oof! spluttered Ben as water crashed against his side. Help! With a hiss, the water reached his fire. Quick Ben urged his driver, but it was too late. With a despairing gasp, Ben stopped. He was stranded in the middle of the drain, with cold seawater lapping his wheels. The fireman set off to find help. Keep on the sleepers, advised the driver. We don't want you swamped as well. The water reached the fireman's waist, but he struggled on. At last, cold and soaking, he reached the yard. Thomas was there, wondering where his trucks were. His driver wasted no time. Ben must be rescued, he said. We need a steel cable, a pair of waders, and determination. Yes, Thomas doubtfully. He understood the cable, but he wasn't sure about determination and didn't even know what waders were. Thomas stopped at the water's edge. His fireman put on the waders and set out, carrying the end of the cable. Ben was delighted to see him. The fireman fastened the cable end to Ben's front coupling. Then he uncoupled the trucks so that Bill, who had come up behind, could pull them clear. Right, he said as he joined Ben's driver in the cab. Let's go! Poor Ben had no steam left to whistle, so the driver and fireman waved to show Thomas they were ready. Carefully, Thomas took the strain as he pulled Ben. Slowly, with water cascading all round him, Ben came out of the drain. Once he was clear, Thomas was properly coupled to him and helped him back to his shed. Thank you, Thomas, said Ben gratefully, and his eyes twinkled for the first time for several hours. It was four days before the water in the drain subsided. When Bill reached home, both twins agreed that it would be ungrateful of them ever to tease Thomas again.
another engine. Rex, Bert and Mike, the small railway engines, were excited. The thin clergyman had written a book about them, and today it was going to be published. Am I in it? asked Frank. He was a diesel and inclined to be grumpy. The small controller shook his head. I'm sorry, he said. You weren't here when the thin clergyman wrote it, I'm afraid, so he didn't know about you. Frank was cross. When his driver came to start in the next day, he refused to go. It's not fair, Frank grumbled. Why can't I be in a book like the others? Cheer up, said his driver. It's only a book. It's got pictures, hasn't it? muttered Frank. I'm not in them either, I suppose. Come on, Frank, said his driver, losing patience. It's teamwork that counts on a railway, not books. He pressed the starter button again. Don't care, growled Frank, and started suddenly. He jerked forward. Before his driver could stop him, Frank hit the wall at the back of the shed. Frank was unhurt, but one of the shed supports was cracked. He was sorry at once, and even sorrier when he realised that the small controller had just come into the shed. The small controller was cross and ordered Frank out to work while he made sure that the shed was safe. That afternoon, Rex left the bottom station with a heavy train. As they climbed the first hill, his driver watched the steam gauge anxiously. We've got a steam leak somewhere, he said. They stopped in a loop to let Mike pass. That helped, but Rex was exhausted when they reached the green. He hardly noticed Frank working in the siding. I think we can make it to the top, encouraged his driver. But they didn't. They had to stop in the next loop, and the driver switched on his radio telephone. Engines on the small railway are now fitted with radio telephones. Their drivers can talk to control, who can then make sure that the trains run safely. Rex has got a badly leaking steam pipe, reported the driver to control. We're all right on our own, but the train is too much for us. Can you help, please? We'll get you out somehow, said control. Don't go away. <laughs> Very funny, muttered Rex. Chance will be a fine thing. Bert passed with a down train. Overworked, that's what we are, he sympathised. We need another engine. About ten minutes later, Rex heard a cheerful toot from behind, and Frank rumbled through the loop. Wonderful things, these radios, said Frank. Control says you need help. I'm to take the train and let you go home alone. Teamwork, my driver calls it. Frank ran ahead, and Rex was uncoupled and backed into the loop. Frank reversed onto the train, and when everything was ready, set off for the top station. Rex hurried home, and his driver set to work to mend the broken steam pipe. The job took a long time. If only we had a spare engine, grumbled the driver. At the top station, Frank's driver apologised to the passengers for being late, but they didn't mind. You put things right very well, they said. We were expecting a walk home. The small controller was pleased too. Well done, Frank, he said. And the shed is not badly damaged either, so we'll say no more about it. But he was thoughtful as he went back to his office. Frank shouldn't have to do rescue acts, he said to himself. We do need another engine. Sticking power. The holiday season was drawing to a close. It had been a busy year and Bert was feeling unwell. Rex and Mike were unsympathetic. Poor old Bert, they said to each other. A shame he's out of puff. No stamina, these youngsters. What you need, Bert, Mike went on, is determination and sticking power. Sticking power be blowed. I might have known I'd get no sympathy from you two, grumbled Bert. I can't get my breath properly, Bert complained to his fitter. You need new tubes, the fitter said. But we can't spare you at present. Keep going and we'll give you a new set during the winter. He paused and looked over his shoulder. Keep it under your dome, he said quietly. But I did hear rumours about a new engine. We need one because if any of you three failed, we'd really be in trouble. He gave Bert's tubes a good clean. This helped a little, but Bert soon felt poorly again. Bert did his best. And one afternoon, he reached the top station feeling very pleased with himself. His train was full, yet he had lost only a few minutes on the journey. His driver put him onto the turntable, and he ran eagerly round his coaches. That 
gives me time for a good breather before we go down again, he said to himself. He simmered happily as he waited for the guard to blow his whistle and wave his green flag. There was a hill near the station and Bert knew that once he was over it, he could run home without losing time. The green flag waved at last. Come on, puffed Bert. Come on, come on, come... Oh! Suddenly there was a jerk and everything seemed easy. Bert's driver looked back. Whoa! He groaned. Back we go. We've left our train behind. The guard met them. The tender coupling's broken, he said. We'll just have to stick around until someone can bring us a spare. Stick around, grumbled Bert crossly. I know what Rex and Mike will say about sticking. His driver looked at him. Hey, exclaimed. You've given me an idea. He disappeared into the station shop and returned carrying a small box. Glue, he explained. It's supposed to stick anything. Even trains, snorted Bert disbelievingly. His driver ignored him and set to work. Now I've heard everything, muttered Bert. Then an idea came to him and he smiled. That'll stop their teasing, he said to himself. At last the job was done. There's no hurry, said Bert's driver. We'll take it steadily and make sure the passengers get home. The guard has told them what has happened and they say they don't mind being late. The hill near the station was the difficult part. Gently, carefully, Bert eased the train over it. After that, though he took care, it was with growing confidence that he trundled the train home. The passengers all congratulated him and gave him three cheers. When Rex and Mike came into the shed that evening, they looked tired. Phew, remarked Mike. Thank goodness we're not as busy as that every day. Berth grinned. Sorry you're tired, he said brightly. I thought you older engines had sticking power. What you need is... And he told them about his adventure with the glue. So that's sticking power, he finished. Never mind. Some of us have it and some of us don't. Good night. And he went happily to sleep. Do you know what I think? asked Bert one evening, soon after the next season began. News to me that you could, said Mike cheekily. I suppose it would be, retorted Bert, never having done any thinking yourself. Rex chuckled, and he and Mike waited. Well, go on, prompted Mike at last. Aren't you going to impress us with your thoughts after all? He winked at Rex. Something, Bert announced after another pause, is going on in the workshop. Work? suggested Rex innocently. Bert took no notice. I think, went on Bert, that the men are building something. I was waiting at the platform yesterday, and the workshop door was open. I couldn't see much, but there was something on the floor inside. It looked like a boiler. Is that all? said Rex. He sounded disappointed. Probably a spare for one of us, said Mike. I don't think so, argued Bert. There were wheels as well. What I think, he paused dramatically, is that they're building a new engine. My fitter said he'd heard a rumour, added Bert. Three small engines looked hopefully at each other. About time too, said Rex. What's the new engine's name? Mike asked his driver the next morning. How did you know about the new engine? the driver asked. It's supposed to be a secret. They told him, and he laughed. I don't think the small controller has chosen a name yet, he said. When he does, I'll let you know. But, a few weeks later, when the new engine came out of the workshop for tests, the small controller had still not decided on a name. How odd, remarked Mike, looking with interest at the new engine's square windows and square top dome. And what a funny colour, put in Rex. No, it's not, said Bert. I like it. The new engine smiled. So do I, he said. My driver says it will be different in the end. This is something he calls an undercoat. Douglas and Duck came to look too. Douglas had just brought some empty ballast trucks along the branch line. He and Duck watched with interest as the new engine was put to his paces. He puts me in mind of my days in Scotland, Douglas remarked. Some of the engines up in the highlands were young colour. Jocks, we used to call them. 
jokes? asked the new engine, stopping nearby. Aye, agreed Douglas. No bad name for yourself, I'm thinking, eh, Jock? The small controller was delighted. Well done, Douglas, he said, and turned to the new engine. What do you think, he asked. It means you'd have to keep your colour, too, to give the name some point. Would you mind? Not a bit, sir, said the new engine. I like the colour, and the name would suit me fine. Excellent, said the small controller. That's settled, then. Thank you, Douglas. A splendid idea. And Douglas puffed away, well satisfied with his morning's work. All the tests on Jock went without a hitch, and when the holiday months came, the new engine had already proved his value. He was stronger than the others, and people even came to the railway on purpose to see him. Unfortunately, this went to his smoke box, and he became rather cocky. One day, Jock was alone at the bottom station. A container of sleepers arrived, but the lorry could not get into the yard. Now what? demanded the lorry driver, scratching his head. No problem, said the small controller. Just arrange the trailer astride the rails and leave it. Jock will do the rest. A cable was fastened between Jock's tender and the trailer, and, puffing hard, Jock pulled the trailer into the yard. Road or rail, what do I care, Jock boasted in the shed that night. The engines looked at each other in dismay. Next day, Mike was waiting at the platform to take a train up the line, when he saw Jock backing down towards him. What's this? he asked as Jock was coupled on. I can manage. The small controller wants me to help, said Jock importantly. The party on the train has asked to see me specially. Oh, has it? said Mike. Well, make sure you don't leave me to push you as well as pull the train. That gave Mike an idea. He whispered to his driver, who grinned and nodded. We'll do it after the green, he said. So, when they restarted from the green, he gradually cut off steam. Now the whole weight of the train, with Mike as well, pulled on Jock's coupling. Smoke and steam shot high in the air as he had to work extra hard. Jock's driver glanced back. When he saw Mike grinning, he realised what was happening. Feeling tired, are you, Mike? asked Jock at the top station. You were enjoying yourself, Mike grinned. I didn't want to spoil your fun. Ah, said Jock. I wondered if perhaps I was going too fast for you. Too fast, spluttered Mike. You wait. But Jock didn't wait. He chuckled and ran quickly away so that Mike could have his turn on the table. Mike was still cross when it was time to leave and started at a great pace. Steady, said his driver. We're not racing anyone. That's what you think, muttered Mike. They stopped at the green. Mike's driver tried to let the water into the boiler, but the injector wouldn't work. Ouch! squeaked Mike. Give me a drink quickly, please. I think I'm going to burst. Your injector has failed, explained the driver, turning to his radio telephone. Now Jock will have to pull us home. What? spluttered Mike. But there was no other way. Mike's fire was put out. Jock moved to the front of the train, and in the end little time was lost. Duck, warned by control, was waiting for any passengers who wanted to go to the big station. Mike went to the shed to be mended, and was feeling better by the time the others arrived. I'm sorry I made you do all the work this morning, Mike apologised when Jock came in. Thank you for bringing me home. That's all right, said Jock. I'm sorry too. It's silly trying to get the better of each other. If I hadn't teased you, perhaps your injector wouldn't have failed. It taught me a lesson. On a railway, it's teamwork that counts. The other three small engines agreed, and looking at them, Jock was glad that he was one of the team.
museum piece. I don't believe it, muttered Gordon furiously. What's Thomas got that an important engine like me hasn't? Tell me that. Gallivanting off to museums. Bah! He is old, said James. If the fat controller says he can be a museum piece, why should we worry? It's not fair, though, grumbled Henry. For a chance like this, he wouldn't have minded being a museum piece himself. The jealous engines all ignored Thomas when they saw him at the junction. Thomas didn't care. He was too excited. Why me? Thomas asked Percy and Toby. Fancy the National Railway Museum people at, where is it, York, wanting me to go there? They've never even seen me. Yes, they have, said Percy. On television, added Toby. The fat controller told us about it. He and Percy wanted to go with Thomas, but they knew that someone had to stay and run the branch line while he was away. How much longer till we go? Thomas asked his driver every morning. One day less than when you asked before, laughed his driver. Anyone would think you wanted to be a museum piece. Thomas grinned. Gordon, Henry and James are just jealous, he chuckled. Who else is at this museum? Is Flying Scotsman there, or Duck's friend, City of Truro? We shall have to wait and see, said the fireman. I'll be very surprised if there isn't someone there that you can remember from the old days. And that, of course, made Thomas more excited than ever. At last the day came. A large crowd came to the junction to see Thomas off, and the fat controller was there too. Goodbye, Thomas, he said. Enjoy yourself and be a credit to our railway. Everyone gave three cheers and Thomas set off. They ran across the island and over the bridge leading to the other railway. It was a slow journey, but at last they reached a place Thomas's driver called Carnforth, where they rested for the night in a big shed. Next day they went on. At Skipton, Thomas stopped for a drink and to let a goods train overtake him. While they waited, it began to rain. In a signal box a little way ahead, the signalman opened his level crossing gates for Thomas and set his signals to clear. Suddenly he heard a crack and then a rattle from the level crossing. The lock on a gate had broken and the wind was swinging the gate across the rails. Steam appeared above the trees as Thomas drew near. Wow! exclaimed the signalman and quickly resetting the signal to danger, he ran to mend the gate. Thomas had never felt happier. His fire was bright and even the rain didn't depress him. They neared a signal. Its arm was up, showing that the line ahead was clear. Away we go, away we go, puffed Thomas happily. He was just passing the signal when he heard a clang as the signal arm fell to danger. Whoa, Thomas, cried the driver and put the brakes hard on. What, Thomas began. But then he saw, just in front, a heavy level crossing gate swinging towards him across the line. The signalman tried to stop it, but the gate was wet and it slipped from his hand. Oh, ah, groaned Thomas as he skidded along the rails. Help! I must stop! But the rain had made the rails slippery and he couldn't. He slithered helplessly. He was still moving when he reached the level crossing. With a loud crack, the gate broke against his buffer beam. Ouch! said Thomas and stopped. The signalman ran to his telephone and then directed Thomas into a siding where an inspector examined him. His buffer beam was bent and one of his buffers was broken. You can't go on like that, said the inspector. Not on the railway anyhow. But I'm supposed to be in York tomorrow, wailed Thomas. I know that, said the inspector. Never mind, leave it to me and I'll see what can be done. And with that, Thomas had to be content. Not the ticket. Thomas had to stay in the siding for the rest of the day. His fire went out and he grew colder and colder. The rain fell more heavily and what had begun as a splendid day began to turn into a disaster. I wish I was in my nice warm shed, he said to himself miserably. At last the inspector returned. Cheer up, Thomas, he said. You'll be at the museum tomorrow, and they have promised to mend your front end in their workshop. Thank you, sir, said Thomas. But if I can't run on rails, how can I get there? It's all fixed, replied the inspector cheerfully. A lorry is coming for you in the morning. 
Thomas was horrified. A l lorry, he stammered. That's right, said the inspector. It'll be here at eight o'clock sharp. Thomas slept badly that night. He kept wondering what Gordon, Henry and James would say if they knew he had finished his journey on a lorry. He almost thought he could hear them laughing. Next morning, the driver and fireman came early. A diesel shunter came to push Thomas out of his siding and along towards the road where they found the lorry waiting. A steel cable was fastened to his coupling. The lorry driver started a winch and in no time at all, it seemed, Thomas was perched on the lorry. How undignified, he thought. But he found, as they went along, that he had a marvellous view of the countryside and time to enjoy it too. But Thomas soon began to feel bored. At last houses began to appear on either side of the road. Perhaps this is York, thought Thomas hopefully. It was, but the driver was unsure of his way. He parked the lorry and went to find a telephone. A man wearing a flat-topped cap with a yellow band round it came up to Thomas. Hello, said Thomas. Hmm, said the man. He wrote something in his notebook and went round to the front of the lorry. When the lorry driver came back, Thomas heard him say something, then slammed the cab door crossly. Soon they reached a large building with rails running into it. Thomas was unloaded and the lorry drove away. Thomas looked about him. He had arrived. When his driver and fireman came, Thomas told them about the man with the flat cap. They laughed loudly. How do you do it, Thomas? spluttered the driver when he could speak. <laughs> that will make the flat controller's day. Thomas booked for parking. Trouble on the line. The museum people were as good as their word. Thomas went at once into the workshop where his buffer beam was soon straightened and a new buffer bolted on. In the workshop was a green engine like Flying Scotsman but smaller. He was called Green Arrow. My brothers and I were built to run fast goods trains, he said, but we did it so well that they let us pull expresses too in the end. Now I'm the only one of my sort left. Green Arrow was so friendly that when Thomas was mended, he was sorry to leave him. But back at the great railway show, he was thrilled to see instead one of Stepney's brothers, Box Hill, an engine he remembered from the old days. Thomas was moved to a special position. There's no doubt about it, said his driver. You're a star attraction. Is that being a credit to the fat controller? asked Thomas. He was anxious to make up for the parking ticket. One morning, Thomas's driver arrived in great excitement. We're to give rides on the demonstration line, he said. Thomas was delighted. The three demonstration lines were different sizes. One was narrower than Thomas's, and the third was used by a very wide engine called Iron Duke. This is broad gauge, he explained. The Great Western Railway used it until about a hundred years ago. Thomas wondered if Duck knew about broad gauge. It would be nice to tell him something about the Great Western, he thought. The engines had to take great care because of the many visitors. Thomas was anxious. Some people were not as careful as they should have been. Thomas had never seen such crowds. We must watch out, he told his driver. What would happen if a child got onto the line? Don't you worry, Thomas, replied the driver. There are plenty of good, strong barriers and we'll take care. But Thomas did worry. He was afraid that in an emergency he might not be able to stop soon enough. Next morning, Thomas felt better. The sun was shining and he was looking forward to talking to Iron Duke again. He chunted happily backwards and forwards along the demonstration line all day. Then, nearly at closing time, it happened. Thomas saw something fly through the air and land on the rails in front of him. His driver saw it too. He put the brakes hard on. Beep, 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 whistled Thomas in alarm. I must stop, I must. Thomas shuddered to a halt and a great cloud of steam whished noisily from his cylinder cocks. But he couldn't stop before he hit the bundle. It burst. Sandwiches and crisps flew in all directions while pop from a broken bottle fizzed over Thomas's wheels. 
In the crowd, a child, frightened by the steam, cried loudly, I want to go home, Mummy, now! screamed the child. You noisy great engine, shouted his mother, waving her fist at Thomas. I'm going to see the manager. Oh dear, thought Thomas. That's not the way to be a credit to the fat controller. You did very well, comforted his driver. Thank goodness it was only a lunch pack and not a child on the line. The fireman was inspecting Thomas. Hey, look at this, he shouted. The driver went to see. You damaged your brakes when you stopped suddenly, he told Thomas. No more work until they're fixed, I'm afraid. Never mind, if the people here today have learned that engines can't stop at once, that's a good thing. Thomas hoped they had. Thomas and the Rail Tour The engines were excited. There were to be some special rail tours to the seaside, and no one knew which engine would be chosen to pull them. It ought to be me, observed Mallard. After all, that seaside place helped to pay for my repairs. The others thought someone else should have a chance. Thomas knew he would not be chosen, but he enjoyed listening to the others arguing. He was pleased in the end when it was decided to give the trips to Green Arrow. When Green Arrow returned from the first tour, he said he had never seen so many people. Soon there was talk of putting on extra trains, but this was not possible. All we can do is add extra coaches, they said. But then Green Arrow can't pull a train that heavy on his own. Of course I can, he scoffed. My brothers and I did during the war. Can I help? asked Thomas. The man in charge stared. I don't see why not, he said. In the morning, Thomas's fireman arrived early. Thomas's fire was lit, and while the warmth crept through his boiler, the fireman made sure all his moving parts were well oiled. Behind, Green Arrow was being prepared too, and when they were both ready, they set off to find their coaches. The station platform was jammed with an admiring crowd, which didn't seem to get any smaller, even after a trainload of people were in their seats. Thomas was coupled in front. He was pleased. He liked to see where he was going. At the seaside station, Thomas was turned round so that he could go in front again. After a rest, the engine set off once more. A ruined abbey stood at a place where the line curved beside a river. A crowd had gathered to wave and cheer, but Thomas wasn't watching them. Looking ahead, he had seen something strange. Peep, peep! Stop, stop! He whistled in alarm. The train was heavy and hard to stop, but they managed it just in time. Now everyone was able to see that, in front of Thomas, the rail near the river was lower than the one on the other side. The water has undermined the embankment, said the inspector. I'll go to the signal box and sort things out. Buses came for the passengers, but it was late before the men decided it would be safe to use the other track. Together, the engines pushed the coaches back to a crossover. On his own, Thomas slowly crept past the landslip. Then, very carefully, Green Arrow pulled the empty coaches by, and together they brought the train back to York. A few days later, a party of important-looking people came into the museum. One was the man in charge, and behind him was the Fat Controller. Oh dear, thought Thomas, they've come to take me away for frightening that child. But the fat controller was smiling. The man in charge held up his hand for silence. Thomas, said the man in charge, your controller told us you are a really useful engine. He is right. For saving a nasty accident the other day, we have decided that you should become an honorary member of the National Railway Collection. This special plate will remind you of your visit to us. Ladies and gentlemen, three cheers for Thomas the Tank Engine! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! The noise nearly raised the roof. Well done, Thomas, smiled the fat controller. I knew you would be a credit to our railway.
no problem. While Thomas was away at York, Percy looked after Annie and Clarabel and took most of Thomas's trains. Daisy ran the fast one, which connected with Gordon's Express at the junction. This made her feel very important. It shows how the fat controller depends on me, she told the others. Toby was in charge of the goods trains and ran down to the harbour. He enjoyed that. His stone trains were dealt with by Mavis, the diesel belonging to the quarry company. One day, snow on the other railway had delayed the train from London, so Gordon's Express was late too. While Daisy was waiting for him at the junction, the blizzard spread across Sodor. Huge white flakes whirled all round, and her driver was worried. Daisy wasn't. What fun, she said to herself. The other engines don't like snow, but I think it's pretty. And I've got the rails to guide me, so it won't give me any trouble. Her driver was not so confident. Daisy hasn't got the weight that a steam engine has, the driver told the guard. She can't push her way through, and we all know how Thomas got stuck, don't we? <laughs> He's told us often enough, laughed the guard. At last Gordon arrived, complaining about engines who were frightened of a bit of snow. It's no problem, boasted Daisy. A few flimsy flakes can't stop me. Quite right, approved Gordon. Well done, but I'm late. I haven't time to gossip. He puffed importantly away. Daisy started confidently, but as they turned towards the valley, the sky darkened and then was completely blotted out by whirling snowflakes. Ugh! exclaimed Daisy as the wind blew them into her face. I don't like this. Neither do I, said her driver. I can't see where we're going. They stopped at the next signal box and Daisy's driver went to talk to the signalman. He came back looking glum. There are deep drifts ahead, I'm afraid, he told the passengers. We can't get through. The signalman says Daisy must take you back to the last station, he went on. We'll get you home from there somehow. If we're lucky, the passengers said to themselves. They went. Before they had gone far, Daisy began to feel ill. She coughed, hiccuped, and stopped. Help, she wheezed. I can't breathe properly. The snow has blocked your air intake, I expect, said her driver. He cleared it but it was soon clogged again. Daisy could go no further. She felt like bursting into tears. The driver got down again and trudged back to the signal box to telephone for help. Daisy felt more miserable every minute. Even her driver when he came back couldn't cheer her up. They've promised to rescue us, he said, but goodness knows how they'll do it. They waited and waited, but no help came. The snow drifted higher and was soon piled all round Daisy. Suddenly she heard a whirring noise from behind. Oh no, she thought, not another blizzard. Daisy was right. It wasn't another blizzard. It was Harold the helicopter. He dropped hot drinks for the passengers and when they were feeling better he lifted them one by one into himself with what Daisy could only describe as a sort of chair thing. The passengers went to the airfield where they were looked after until they could reach home. Harold couldn't help Daisy. It was a cold, miserable week before Toby rescued her. She doesn't think snow is so pretty now. Wash out. Near the end of Thomas's branch line there is a small station and, close by, the railway crosses a stream on a short bridge. As the snow melted, the water in the stream rose higher and higher, rushing and swirling in its hurry to reach the river at the bottom of the valley. Each time he passed the place, Percy watched the water anxiously. Don't worry, said his driver, it's got to come a lot higher before it can stop us. Percy shivered. He could remember the time when he'd been stuck in a flood. He had got very cold and very wet. Next morning, Toby came up from the harbour. No problem with the stream, he said cheerfully. The water is much lower today. That's good, said Percy. 
he set off happily with Annie and Clarabelle, and when they stopped at the small station, Percy looked carefully at the stream. His driver went to look too. Toby was right. The water level was much lower. All's well, Percy, said his driver. Come on, we've got a timetable to keep. They hurried to the junction where Henry was waiting for them. When is Thomas coming back? asked Henry. If he does, he added, I shouldn't be surprised if he decides to stay as a museum piece. <laughs> He's old enough. He puffed away, chortling at his own wit. Annie and Clarabelle were most upset. Percy had to spend so much time comforting them that he was late leaving with his next train. Percy had his tank refilled with water at the station by the river, and this made him later still. Never mind, said his driver, we don't need to stop at the station near the stream this trip, so there's nothing more to delay us. They reached the stream quickly, but as Percy ran onto the bridge, he felt it sink slightly under his wheels. There was an ominous creak. The bridge swayed. Don't stop, Percy, shouted his driver in alarm. Keep moving! Percy didn't mean to stop, and that was lucky. Clarabelle was the rear coach. As she crossed the bridge, it wobbled again. When her back wheels left it, there was a sudden loud crash. The bridge vanished. One second it was there, the next it wasn't. It was safe to stop now. Percy's driver put on the brakes and the fireman ran back to look. All he could see of the bridge was lying in the middle of the brown rushing stream. Annie, Clarabelle and Percy were badly shaken. The guard telephoned a warning and then they all went quickly home. The fat controller closed the line while the bridge was mended. At first Toby and Percy enjoyed their rest but they soon grew bored. When the bridge was repaired, Daisy had recovered from her snowy ordeal too, and things returned to normal. But for some time afterwards, Percy was extra careful whenever he crossed the stream in which he had almost had a bath. Toby's Mega Train Toby was delighted to take Percy's stone trucks down to the harbour. He thought it a wonderful treat. Percy could not understand why. It's only a harbour, he said. Nothing special. I like it, said Toby. It reminds me of the old days. I worked at a harbour on the other railway. I told you, remember? Because Toby had only a small water tank, he always had to refill it at the station by the river. What if we've run out of water halfway? Toby wondered anxiously. We shan't, said his driver confidently. But what if the water column breaks down? asked Toby. Thomas warned me about the water from that river. His driver laughed. Don't worry, Toby, he said. We shan't take you fishing. The harbour was busy, and Toby worked hard. Not only did the stone trucks have to be taken down, but when they had been unloaded, they had to be sent back, often full of things brought in by the ships. One day, the stone trucks from the quarry didn't come. Toby waited in the yard. It's not like Mavis to be late, he said to himself. I hope she hasn't had an accident and met another lorry that forgot to look where it was going. At last the station master came over. Mavis wasn't well this morning, he said. She's better now and she's on her way. And indeed, it was not long before, with a cheerful toot, Mavis rumbled into the yard. Toby wasted no time in setting off himself. At the harbour, Toby found so many trucks waiting to go back that there was hardly room for what he had brought. Phew, whistled the driver. Forty-eight trucks and not all empty either. Some mega train. Two journeys, really, but we haven't time today. We could leave some and make two trips tomorrow. Can't we take them all now? asked Toby. The guard scratched his head and Toby's crew looked doubtful. We shall be all right, urged Toby, and so they agreed. But Toby had forgotten his small water tank. He had also forgotten that the journey was all uphill. He had to work hard and use so much steam that by the time they reached the station by the river, he had very little water left. His fireman put in the water pipe and turned the tap. Nothing happened. Oh, dear, groaned Toby. Now what? 
You could make it on your own, said his driver, but not pulling this load. Then he winked at the fireman. Well, the driver went on, I do know somewhere. Is it far? asked Toby. The driver laughed. <laughs> not really, he said, and went to see the signalman, who told him where to leave the trucks. Toby pushed them carefully into a siding. Then he was uncoupled, and they set off up the line. Where are we going to get water? he asked. You'll see, smiled his driver, and stopped Toby right in the middle of the river bridge. Now, said the driver, where's my bucket? Ugh, protested Toby, you promised. His driver and fireman laughed heartily. <laughs> We're only pulling your wheels, Toby, they said at last. We'll go to the top station for water, then come back for the trucks. When Toby told Percy what had happened, Percy wanted to help, but his driver reminded him that he had a train of his own to run in a few minutes. Don't worry, said Toby. I'll follow you down and have those trucks back up here in a jiffy. And he did too. Thomas comes home. Workmen were mending the road near the level crossing. They sectioned off part of it with red and white cones and a steamroller chuffered importantly. His name was George. He was a most unpleasant steamroller. Railways are no good, he grumbled. Turn them into roads. Nonsense, said Daisy one day. No one could reach the villages in the valley without our railway. I'd build a road along your old tracks, said George. Nothing to it. My mates have done it all over the place. Daisy told Percy and Toby what George had said. Toby was worried because he knew George was right. The fat controller wouldn't allow it, he said. But he wasn't convinced. Daisy was reassured, but she was careful to do nothing to upset George, just in case. Then something happened which made them forget all their worries. Daisy was at the platform when the station master came to talk to her driver. He had a letter in his hand. Thomas is coming back next week, he said. The engines were delighted, and so, of course, were Annie and Clarabelle. The fat controller is holding a welcome home celebration at the junction, Daisy told George. Lot of nonsense, he snorted. Makes no difference. Your railway will be a road before long. You'll see. At last, everything was ready. The engines and coaches were to go to the junction, and Daisy was to come last with a special train carrying the station masters, Mr. and Mrs. Kindly, and other important people. Daisy set off happily from the top station. She stopped at the station near the level crossing for her last passengers. There was no sign of George, but some red and white cones lay nearby. Two of them were even inside the crossing gates. The guard blew his whistle. Hoo <coughs> tooted Daisy. Away we go! And she rattled towards the level crossing. As she did so, a gust of wind blew a cone towards her. It disappeared beneath Daisy's wheels. Ouch! She squealed and stopped. The guard removed the cone, which was now looking very battered. Grrr, groaned Daisy, trying to move. Help! I'm stuck! The driver got down to look. That cone has damaged your brakes, he told her. They've jammed hard on. Oh no! wailed Daisy. Now the passengers won't get to Thomas's welcome in time. Why can't that stupid George clear his rubbish up properly? I bet he did it on purpose. Can't be helped, Daisy, said her driver. We'll do what we can. A fitter came, and the three men worked hard while Daisy stood and fretted. We're going to miss Thomas, I know we are, she fumed. But at last the job was done, and Daisy set off with a roar. As they came near the junction, Daisy could see a large crowd on the platform. Suddenly she heard a cheer. Oh dear, she groaned, we're too late. No, we're not, said her driver. Thomas isn't here yet. It's us they're cheering. Just then the signal arm dropped and a familiar whistle sounded in the distance. Thomas came into the station. He looked tired, but he was smiling broadly. 
he carried the plaque which the National Railway Museum had given him. Welcome home, Thomas, said the Fat Controller. We are all proud of you and delighted to see you safely back, especially Annie and Clarabelle. Everyone laughed and the Fat Controller held up his hand. Three cheers, he called, for Thomas, our famous tank engine. Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Out of Puff The Express is a long, heavy train. Gordon usually pulls it, but only as far as the other railway. Another engine takes the coaches from there to London. It is an important train too, and must always run whatever happens. If Gordon is ill or busy somewhere else, James or Henry have the chance to pull it. They try their best and do it well. Too well, perhaps, because sometimes the importance of the occasion goes to their smoke boxes and makes them boastful. One day, Henry was feeling pleased with himself. He had run the express to time, and the fat controller had congratulated him. I don't know what the fat controller would do without me, he said importantly in the shed that evening. Have a care, warned Douglas. Too much puff about yourself and you'll maybe run out of puff one day. Pooh, scoffed Henry. I pulled two trains and a failed diesel once, and the fat controller said I was an enterprising engine. Aye, I mind it well, agreed Donald. I took the goods train on, you recall, but Dougie is right. Puff goes before a fail. The Scottish twins were wasting their own puff, of course, because Henry took no notice whatsoever. A little later, the railway had to begin using a new sort of coal. It was dusty and burned with clouds of thick black smoke. The fat controller was cross, and the engines didn't like it either. Filthy rubbish, they grumbled. The new coal made more ash, too. Before long, all the engines began to have pains in their smoke boxes. Hot ash collected there and gave them the most awful indigestion. One evening, Henry felt dreadful when he got back to the shed. His fireman had to clean an enormous pile of ash from his smoke box before he felt better. But the next day, Henry could not make steam properly. He struggled to Edward's station, but could go no further. Douglas was there. I can't breathe, Henry wheezed. Boot a puff, are you? asked Douglas. Then I say we didn't warn you. Henry couldn't answer. Douglas took his train for him. The fireman cleared away more ashes, but when he tried to close Henry's smoke box door, it did not make the airtight fit that it should have done. Those hot ashes have bent your smoke box door, he said. Air is coming in so that you can't breathe properly through your fire. But I know how we could cure that. He filled a bucket with water. Then he fetched all the old newspapers he could find from the station bookstore. The driver helped him tear them into strips, which they soaked in the water. What are you doing? asked Henry anxiously. Making something called papier-mâché, explained the driver. When this paper is soggy enough, we shall paste it in your air leak so that you can breathe better. It won't last forever, but it will get us home. Oh, said Henry, unhappily. His driver was right. 
When the job was done, Henry felt much better, and even the driver and fireman were surprised how well he steamed. We'll have to get the fat controller to make it permanent, they joked. Henry went very carefully and reached the shed without mishap. His story was there before him, of course. Donald and Douglas didn't say anything, but now and then made sort of breathless, puffing noises. Henry thought they must have a very odd sense of humour. Overhaul What you need, Henry, the fat controller told him, is an overhaul. Yes, sir, agreed Henry. Does that mean I've got to go away to crew again, sir? The fat controller laughed. Not this time, he said. You won't believe this, Henry, but nowadays the people at crew couldn't do the work you need. Henry stared, and the fat controller laughed again. Don't worry, he said. We can do everything at my works. All I have to do is get you there. If James takes the express tomorrow, went on the fat controller, we can couple you in front. Do what you can to help, and you can go to the works in style. Henry told James that night. Help me, James snorted. I don't need help. I can pull the express by myself, thank you. Overhaul indeed. Two engines on one train is an overhaul, if you ask me. But the fat controller had already made the arrangements, so there was nothing James could do about it. Next morning, James backed onto the coaches in the big station. Henry followed and was coupled in front. James was not in the best of tempers, but when the fat controller came to see them off, James tried not to show how cross he was. Good luck, Henry, said the fat controller. The people at the works know what to do, so you won't be there too long. James and Bear will take turns with the express when Gordon is busy. The express only stops once before it reaches the other railway, and that is at the work station. Because of his leaky smoke box, Henry could not help very much, but he saved his hardest effort for Gordon's Hill. The two engines raced up it faster than they'd ever done. When they reached the top, James was feeling better. That was fun, he said. We might even be early at the workstation. We shall need extra time to uncouple you anyway. James spoke too soon. They had just crossed the viaduct when Henry felt something wrong with one of his wheels. Something's wobbling, he told his driver. Just then they both heard a cracking noise. Ouch! exclaimed Henry. Whatever it is, I think it's broken. They were passing a station. Something hit the platform and a brick flew past Henry's cab. It bounced off James's boiler and disappeared. Ow! exclaimed James. Henry might need mending, but he needn't throw his broken bits at me. Just then, James and his driver heard Henry whistling to warn them that he wanted to stop. More bits and pieces flashed by, some hitting the carriages. Using the brakes skillfully, the drivers stopped the train. Then, while the guard made sure that the train was protected behind, James's driver went to see if any passengers had been hurt by the flying debris. No one had, but one of the carriage windows was broken. Henry's crew inspected his wheel. The trouble was not hard to find. Your wheel has a steel rim called a tyre, Henry's fireman told him. It has broken and come off. It's a miracle it didn't do more damage. James pushed Henry into a siding and went back to the train. An overhaul, is it? grinned James as he passed. It sounds as if you need retiring, you poor old thing. He guffawed loudly at his own wit and puffed away. Henry smiled to himself. I don't know about retiring, he chuckled. I certainly feel tired. Sliding scales because Henry was at the works, the other engines had to help with the flying kipper, too. This is a special train of vans filled with boxes of fish, which goes to markets in London and other places on the mainland. James did not like the flying kipper. All those smelly vans, he complained one morning. You can't get the smell off your tender for weeks. I'm very fond of a good kipper, remarked his driver. You're welcome to it, retorted James. 
A right old misery today, aren't you? said his fireman. You got out of the shed by the wrong door this morning, and no mistake. Now get a move on, or the fat controller will give you something to moan about. Groaning horribly on the curves, James went slowly down to the harbour. The vans for the train were already in the shed, while men in aprons worked busily, loading them with boxes of fish. Poo! said James, wrinkling his nose. James was coupled to the vans. He had not been waiting long when a forklift truck laden with fish boxes rounded the corner and came towards him. Another, hurrying away for a new load, came too fast in the opposite direction. The loaded one swerved to avoid the other one and its heavy load shifted. Six full boxes slipped from the top of the pile and burst open on the rails in front of James. James closed his eyes in horror. Ugh! He shuddered. Broken fish and boxes lay everywhere. For once James was right, the smell was not nice. Luckily there was plenty of time for the men to clear up the mess before James had to leave. A good job the boxes didn't fall on you, James, said his driver, winking at the fireman. James shuddered again. The idea was too awful to think about. At last all was ready and the guard showed his green lamp. Thank goodness, said James to himself. There was a speed limit in the harbour area, so James could not start quickly. The train seemed heavier than usual tonight too, so that when he reached the spot where the fish boxes had burst, he was moving at no more than walking pace. The rails seemed clean, but oil and scales from the spilt fish were still there, coating them with a slippery film. As soon as James reached the place, his driving wheels, with nothing to grip, began to spin helplessly. James did his best, but the heavy vans dragged him to a standstill. He found he could move neither forward nor back. Fish! exclaimed James in disgust. Men brought hoses and washed the rails. James grew very wet and uncomfortable. Then they put sand on the rails in front of each driving wheel, and James was at last able to move his train. He was very late, but at least he was off the fish key. To say he was glad would be putting it mildly. Henry C. Red Henry found life boring at the works. The men worked hard to make him better, but it seemed ages before he was ready. At last, however, when he had passed the test to make sure he was mended properly, men came to repaint him. But Henry saw that instead of nice green paint, they had something very different in their paint pots. That's not right, protested Henry. The fat controller wants me to be green with red stripes, not red all over like... like tomato sauce. The painters laughed. You'd look very handsome, Henry, they said. But don't worry, this paint is a special sort of undercoat. You shall have proper green with red stripes before we've finished. Undercoat, muttered Henry in disgust. Whatever would the other engines say if they saw me looking like this? The men laughed and carried on painting. Early next morning, his driver came. Wake up, Henry, he said. There's an emergency at the big station, and the fat controller says you're to help. But I can't go like this, exclaimed Henry. They'd all laugh like anything. No choice, said his driver. The diesel pulling the express has failed, and the fat controller needs you to take over. It's either us or a long walk for the passengers, and you know the fat controller wouldn't like that. The fireman raised steam as quickly as he could, and Henry blushing with embarrassment, set off for the big station. The fat controller was pleased to see him. I feel so silly looking like this, complained Henry. The fat controller laughed. You do look unusual, Henry, he agreed, but you have helped me out of a very awkward situation, so don't worry about it. But Henry did worry. Soon, too soon for Henry, it was time to start. The express was heavy, and Henry felt the drag of the coaches. We'll need help on Gordon's Hill today, remarked his driver. But they were in trouble earlier than that. 
As they approached Edward Station, the brakes went wrong on the last coach of the train and they had to stop and uncouple it. To make matters worse, Donald, who should have been there to help, had been called away. Henry had to push the coach into a siding himself and, without Donald, there was no one to help him on the hill. Never mind, comforted his driver. You can do it. You're an enterprising engine, remember? Henry snorted. He didn't feel very enterprising just then. The men at the works had mended Henry well. His driver gave him as good a start as he could. It was hard going, but now Henry felt fired with determination. Let them laugh at my red paint, he snorted. I'll show them. Slowly he struggled upwards. I can do it! I can do it! I can do it! He panted. Oh dear, will the top never come? Then, suddenly, there it was. I've done it! I've done it! I've done it! He puffed proudly. After that, it was much easier, and they reached the other railway quickly. The fat controller, who had been on the train, came to congratulate Henry. Well done, Henry, he said. I'm very proud of you. Perhaps all my engines should be painted red, but you have certainly earned your proper green with red stripes, which, of course, is just what Henry got. And when he at last returned to the shed, there was a warm welcome for Henry the Green Engine. Percy's porridge. Donald and Douglas were rushed off their wheels. The fat controller came to see them. I know you don't mind hard work, he said, but you can't be everywhere at once. You need some help on the branch lines. The Scottish twins were grateful. I have a plan, the fat controller told them. He went to see a friend who lived in Gloucestershire and explained the problem. The friend took him to meet Wilbert, a smart blue saddle tank engine with six wheels. Your owner says you can come and help me for a while, the fat controller told Wilbert. Would you like that? Wilbert was delighted. Yes, please, sir, he said eagerly. His line in the Forest of Dean was short, and he was delighted for the chance to exercise his wheels. If you are as good as I think you will be, the fat controller went on, I know where I can get another engine like you, and then you'll be able to go back home. Percy was excited when he heard the news. Another saddle tank, sir, he said. Is he like me, sir? The fat controller laughed. He's bigger and stronger than you, Percy, he said. Besides, you can manage your trucks. I want him to help duck, so I'm afraid you may not even meet him. During the week before Wilbert came, it was cold and wet. The engines thought it would never stop raining. None of them wanted to go out, but passengers and trucks were waiting. Just the sort of weather when you need porridge for breakfast, laughed Percy's driver. What's porridge? asked Percy. It's a, well, difficult to describe, admitted the fireman. You boil oatmeal and water, uh, which makes a sort of sticky soup, finished the driver. Then you add milk and sugar. Delicious. At the station by the river, sacks were being stacked on the platform. The men who had filled them had worked fast, and they had not tied the sacks properly. As the porter lifted the last sack, the signal arm dropped with a clang. Better hurry, here's Percy, the porter said, and he swung the heavy sack onto the pile, knocking the top one over. Several sacks toppled onto the railway line and split open. The oatmeal inside the sacks burst out, covering everything. The pouring rain quickly turned it into a sort of sticky soup. At that moment, Percy appeared. Percy wasn't going fast, but he couldn't prevent himself from ploughing into the porridge which now covered the rails. Ugh! he exclaimed and stopped. Porridge dripped from Percy's wheels, rods and frames. He felt awful, 
wet, sticky and cold. His driver and fireman got down to inspect the mess. Oh dear, remarked the driver. Well, Percy, you found out about porridge the hard way, haven't you? The thing is, you're supposed to eat it, not paddle in it. Percy didn't think it was funny. The fat controller wasn't amused either. He telephoned to the junction where they were just in time to stop Wilbert on his way to Duck's branch line. He came along Thomas's line instead and soon reached the shed at the top station. Percy cheered up at once. I wanted to meet you, he said, but I didn't think it would be this way. Porridge is all right for breakfast, my driver says, but it makes a mess of an engine who isn't expecting it. Cab over wheels. You're lucky to have a long line, Wilbert told Thomas and Toby. Mine is only one and a half miles long, with a station at Norchard and another at Lydney. The scenery is super, though, and my driver says it's better up the valley. Our volunteers are going to open that bit, too. They work hard, but it takes a long time. One of Wilbert's first jobs was at the lead mine. Don't pass the danger notice, Thomas warned. I fell down a mine once. Wilbert smiled. I've worked in a colliery, he said, so I know about danger notices. But, he added, there was an engine once who thought he knew better. What happened? asked Toby and Thomas. Wilbert paused. This engine didn't have a name, he began. Just a number, 16, and he worked in a steelworks. One of the jobs that Sixteen and his friends had to do was to take the waste from the works in special trucks to a place they called the Tip. Well, went on Wilbert, Sixteen got tired of always stopping in the same place. He tried to go further, but his driver always prevented him. The other engines tried to stop him too. If the notice says danger, you shouldn't pass it, they said. Sixteen paid no attention. Don't be stupid, his driver said. We mustn't pass the notice, or goodness knows where we shall end up. But Sixteen wanted to know. Pooh, he scoffed. I can take care of myself. One wet day, Sixteen's chance came. The rails were slippery, and when his driver tried to stop, he couldn't. You see, Sixteen had asked the trucks which were in front of him to carry on past the warning sign. They did just that, and their momentum pulled Sixteen with them. You silly engine, scolded his driver. Wasn't my fault, muttered Sixteen sulkily. It was those trucks. You've always wanted to pass that board, said the driver crossly. I believe you asked them to drag us on purpose. A foreman ran towards them. What are you doing there, driver, he shouted. It's not safe. The trucks dragged us, explained the driver. Well, come to the office with me, and you, fireman, get your engine back on firm ground before it's too late, ordered the foreman. But it was already too late. As the foreman turned away, the earth beneath Sixteen's wheels sank, and the rails sagged. A small rush of stones clattered away to the bottom of the bank. Sixteen's fireman knew that if he tried to move the engine now, he would only make things worse. Ooh, uh, groaned Sixteen. Beneath his weight, the rails sagged even more. Suddenly, they fell away completely. As the fireman leapt for safety, Sixteen overbalanced. The coupling between him and the trucks broke, and he rolled cab over wheels down the bank. He reached the bottom with a crash and lay on his side, looking surprised and leaking steam in all directions. Help! he gasped weakly. Thomas and Toby were silent. What happened to Sixteen after that? ventured Toby. Oh, he was rescued, Wilbert said, but he wasn't repaired, and he was sent to the back of the shed in disgrace. Is he still there? asked Thomas. He got better than he deserved, smiled Wilbert. Some preservation people came and bought him, and now he lives in the Midlands, but I think he's lucky to have been given a second chance. Thomas and Toby could only agree. Foaming at the funnel. There is a dairy beside Thomas's branch line at the station where the lines divide to go either to the harbour or to the junction. Every afternoon special tanker wagons are pushed into the dairy siding. They are filled with milk and Percy takes them to the junction on his first train every morning. Thomas explained this to Wilbert. There's a hose pipe thing which puts the milk into the tankers, he said. They'll be ready by the time you get there for the first train. Sounds easy enough, said Wilbert. 
Thomas told him a great many other details too. Wilbert listened carefully, trying hard to remember them all. Next day he enjoyed himself. He was a much more powerful engine than Percy, so he found that he could cope easily with Percy's trains. The trucks behaved well too, which was a help. He's strong, he is, they muttered to each other. Don't upset him. You never know what he might do to get his own back. One day, Wilbert took loaded stone trucks to the harbour. On his way back with empty ones, he stopped at the station by the dairy and pushed the empty trucks into a siding. He left them and set out towards the junction, pulling just a few vans. Right, he thought happily, I leave these vans at the junction and bring the empty tankers back. Then, when those are put in the dairy siding, I take the stone trucks onto the top station. They met James at the junction. James knew who Wilbert was, of course, and asked how he was getting on. Wilbert chatted excitedly about the jobs he'd been given to do that day. Sounds as if you're enjoying yourself, James said, but it's best to take things slowly at first, and he puffed away. Wilbert continued his journey and reached the dairy station easily, but his fireman was worried about water. We should have filled up at the junction, he said, but you were busy chatting to James. Never mind, we'll get water here. The tankers were at the end of the train, so all Wilbert had to do was push them into the dairy siding. Then he drew forward and stopped beside the hose pipe. Just in time, said the fireman, and he put the hose into Wilbert's tank. As he turned the tap, the driver spoke to him. The fireman went to reply, but when he returned, he found that Wilbert had stopped at the wrong hose pipe. His tank was full, but not with water, with milk. You'll be foaming at the funnel if any of this gets in the boiler, gasped the driver. Quickly they put out Wilbert's fire, and the fireman telephoned for help. Thomas came as soon as he could and pulled Wilbert back to the top station. Wilbert's tank was emptied and was given a thorough clean. Next morning he was quite all right again. You and Percy make a fine pair, laughed Thomas. He had the porridge and you had the milk. Wired up. As soon as Percy came home, the fat controller came to see Wilbert. You've done well so far, the fat controller told him, apart from drinking all that milk. Wilbert looked abashed. I'm sorry, sir, he said. I... It's all right, Wilbert, smiled the fat controller. A mistake any engine could make. But now Percy is back, you can go to help on Duck's branch line. Wilbert puffed away. Percy and the others were sorry to see him go. Duck and Oliver made Wilbert very welcome. Duck let him travel in front of his next train so that he could see what the line was like. Wilbert enjoyed this, but found running beside the sea very different from his sheltered valley in Gloucestershire. Next day he began regular work. During the afternoon he took some ballast wagons to the loading dock beside the small railway. Rex, Bert, Mike and Jock were delighted to show off their station to a new engine. Like the other trucks, those on Duck's line decided that they had better behave too. Donald and Douglas had kept them all in order, but Wilbert made sure they didn't forget what the twins had taught them. One day, Wilbert was at the ballast loader. As he tried to pull some full trucks away, there was a loud crack and he shot suddenly backwards. The fireman got down to look. The coupling gear on the wagon has pulled away, he said. Now what? Beside them, watching with interest, was Bert. I pulled a train which was glued together once, when one of my couplings broke, he said. We need more than glue here, said Wilbert's driver. Then he noticed a coil of signal wire lying beside the line. Could we do anything with that, he asked. You'd never move the train with wire, objected the fireman. But what about just one truck, suggested Wilbert. I bet I could pull one truck with wire. Brilliant, said the station master, who'd come to see what was wrong. I'll go and tell the signalman what you're doing. Let me know when you're ready. The fireman wound the wire round the truck's buffer beam, leaving long loops. These he twisted into a rope, making a small loop at the end, which he fastened to Wilbert's coupling hook. A shunter uncoupled the front truck from the rest, and at last everything was ready. Right, Wilbert, said his driver, gently now. He opened the regulator very carefully, easing Wilbert slowly backwards. The wire tightened, stretched, and held. 
Slowly, the truck followed Wilbert out of the siding, and he could then push it into another, out of the way. Then, he went back to his ballast train. This time, there was no trouble, and he reached the big station late, but safely. By the end of his stay, the fat controller knew that an engine like Wilbert was exactly what he needed. I am delighted, Wilbert, said the fat controller. Please take our best wishes to your friends in the Forest of Dean. We hope your line there will be as successful as your work here. Thomas, Percy, Toby and Daisy came to the junction to see Wilbert off and whistled cheerfully as he passed. Beep, beep, called Wilbert. I've had a wonderful time, but I'm looking forward to getting home. Goodbye. Thank you. And with a whistle, he rounded the curves and disappeared into the tunnels.